Good morning, and welcome to Sunday Coffee. Joining me this morning for some coffee, the Constitution, and probably some other shenanigans is TK Epley. I'm your host, Dr. Dan Ford, and this is Echelon Orchid. Good morning, TK. Good morning. Good doctor. How are you? Oh, you know, drinking some liberal tears again this morning. I am purveying from Baja Coffee. All right. <laughs> Stanbridge, Virginia Beach, comma, USA. <laughs> is it still in the United States? Is Virginia still a part of the United it States? Is. Probably. It's probably. <laughs> probably. We're still a part of the union. <laughs> I mean, it wouldn't be the first time they, they seceded. No, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. oh. <clears throat> so you know how how was your new year? It was quiet. It was it was very quiet. Um, so yeah, a good a good start. So yeah, it's uh you know I I was reflecting back with my team because a lot of people want to say that 2020 being so bad because of COVID, and I said, look at all the opportunities it's afforded us now. Right. There's <clears throat> there's so many positives about 2020 that. You know, if COVID hadn't happened, would we have accomplished those same things? Um, it really, it gave a lot of people, and I hate using the term work-life balance because it always balances out, but I would say it gave people a much more cognizant focus on having a quality life as opposed to your life being around work. Right. And, uh, you know, for me, that certainly uh, was true. You know, I got to spend a lot more time with my family than I ever have before. I think, I also think that, you know, it afforded, a, it afforded in a positive way, certainly from a technical aspect or technology aspect, uh, change that was coming anyway, right? You know, and there were, you know- It was inevitable, the, I think. Yeah. Right, one of the hardest things to do is to get people to change behavior if something doesn't appear to be broken. Um, and it's, it comes back to the vision thing, right? If I can't imagine something's right or wrong, I'm going to stick with what I have. Whereas, you know, for the most part, unless you are, unless you run a, you know, um, some sort of business where you've got customer service and people have to be in the building, why do I need to be there? All right. And we talk about it. We talk about it with software sales, right? We don't use the four P's for marketing and sales anymore. We use the save method, right? So instead of, instead of place, you have access, right? Because we provide access to things. And if I'm providing access to my customer base as a as a as an enterprise, why don't I provide access to my employees? All right? And I think so. Um, and again, with you know, everybody wants things to be seamless when uh, when we have change, but that's never going to happen. And that's part of if you know that's that thing of hey, you have to be comfortable at being uncomfortable. That's how you facilitate greatness, right? Because nothing great has ever happened without conflict and dissent. And this year we proved that, you know, time and time again, that, you know, I look at the restaurant industry, complete upheaval, right? From, from the service industry and how many people have been displaced. But <clears throat> on the back side of that, you look at other folks that have been able to pivot um, for whatever reason, right? And those demographics uh, will prove out how, why certain businesses survived and why certain businesses didn't. Um, but one of the restaurants I go to all the time, and I don't, for those of you that don't know me, I don't, I don't tend to frequent chain restaurants or big box restaurants. I, I like knowing the owners and the people that, uh, you know, are in my neighborhood, so to speak. And uh, I was at one restaurant that I've been going to for 20 plus years. And I was, you know, I was like, hey, how'd it go this year? Like, oh, it was our best year ever. And I'm like, wow, because they pivoted to understanding how to do takeout and delivery correctly, right? To really, really power it to the point where now that the restaurant's open and with, you know, modified seating, if you don't get there by five o'clock, it's going to take you an hour to get food because they've got so many um, to go orders. Right. And I mean, early on, a bunch of us would just get in our vehicles and show up in the parking lot on a Sunday afternoon and go in and get wings and, you know, little cocktails and stand out in the stand out and have a tailgate party effectively uh, to try to, you know, as, they, as everybody was figuring it out. And so uh, I think there's a lot of positive in that too, you know, and I, I think, you know, industry is certainly adapts because it's not going out of business. Right. And think about 
for everybody that's every business has kind of gone into the downturn, you know, the positive is who's really who's really gotten innovative about how to deliver their goods and services in the in the world that we're forced to inhabit right now. Very true. You know, it's 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 I think in many ways as well, the reason why many chain restaurants and, and I and I'll say this somewhat loosely because there are some chains that do the I believe the franchise model correctly to where they can still be a part of a community. Um, I, and I don't mean necessarily like a McDonald's or a Burger King, not the fast food like chain restaurants, you know, and I'm sure there are probably some that that do well. Um, but in in the DC area, Lito's Pizza. I mean, it's a um, it is local a franchise. franchise. Yeah, it's right. a local franchise, and they're pretty strict as to who they allow into the family. Um, right. My my cousin owns two Lito's Pizzas, and his uh, has been consistently ranked as the the number one Lito's um, out in Crofton, Maryland. Um, so you know, <clears throat> it's 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 one of those things where. Uh, Many of those chain restaurants, it is only about the dollar, right? And those are the ones I don't want to support. Like I don't, I don't support Starbucks, even though they're not a chain. I mean, they're not a chain; they're big box, in my opinion. Right. And they don't do enough for the community, and they'll be the first ones to leave a community. And we saw this with COVID. A lot of these places, um, like you know, another one that I'll I'll never frequent again. And I used to, you know, enjoy their their wings, um, and I could watch, you know, a bunch of sports, which is TGI Fridays. Okay. I will I will never go back to a Fridays because when things got bad, you know, and here in Indiana, <clears throat> they closed up. They just shut right. down. They said we're leaving, we're out, we're done. I'm like, okay, well, <clears throat> okay. So here's I have a I have a I have a I have a question because I want to yeah. I want to see what your opinion is on this. A lot of a lot of those big box retailers, right? Whether it's in the food business or anything else, right? I think they were TGI Fridays has been teetering on the teetering on the edge of irrelevance and bankruptcy probably for a lot longer than anybody knows. And I mean, <clears throat> for the most part, TGI Fridays has become a punchline in most movies, right? Yeah. And and that's that's where we're at. Do you think that they closed up because? They were like, we don't want to lose a dollar or that it was, hey, this is a great convenient excuse for us to finally resize and liquidate like we've always wanted to. And we'll take less heat for it because of the of the restrictions that COVID put on us. And we've got to do what we've got to do. And it gave largely, you know, what you and I would probably say are corporate drone leaders that are just out there counting, counting beans every day of the week. It gave them the excuse and the wherewithal they needed or the cover they needed to make changes that they probably needed to make in their business model 10 years ago that they've slowly been creeping in rather than pulling the Band-Aid off back in the day. Yeah, I think there's a little bit of both to mm -hmm. that. You know, the in many ways, I'll say Fridays, you know, acted very similar to uh, BlackBerry <clears throat> and, and, that, and so much that they were one of the really popular chains for a while. And yep. then they didn't really pivot when you had Applebee's really making a, a, a big thing. And then you've got um, Buffalo Wild Wings coming into the picture. And um, what's the, uh, you've got, what, what's the, the Italian one that, um, but I can't remember the name. Um, anyway, there was an Italian one that they, you know, they had. So all of a sudden, Fridays didn't really have anything that was special. And now there was a lot more competition and they never really, pivoted right. um, to that. And, um, you know, as such, I mean, this is probably, you know, it was a good opportunity for them to be able to get out from a, from a business perspective, because they felt like, as you said, not take as much heat. I still go, well, you're, you know, you be, own up as if this is my, right, right. this is my place. Say, look, you know, because of this, you know, we're now going to take the opportunity to restructure and come back out with a better model. Um, and instead they just, you know, it was almost like the, uh, the, the Baltimore Colts moving to Indianapolis just overnight. They just, uh, decided to move. <laughs> so now, how, do, how do we know, I know I'm being devil's advocate right now. How do I know that right now TGI Fridays or any of these retailers that have done the, have, have effectively vanished from the community? How do we know they're not doing that? How do you know they're not, you know, is it that 
they're just they they suck at communicating, right? And they're they're eventually going to pop back out when when they can, or that they are who we say they are. And <clears throat> this was just the way to, to you know to basically rid the fat as they would look at it. I, I don't. I don't know. Yeah, the right thing for that. yeah. I I don't know the the right thing, you know, and 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 perhaps I'm not as informed as I would like to be. I mean, there's oh, always I probably not. something. I mean, right? we're, we're spitballing right here, right now. Yeah, absolutely. And and but I just look at how they did it, mm -hmm. and so I don't know the <clears throat> the why. I know the result, and that but, result could be poor communication. But then I just go. But communication is supposed to be a big part, especially today, you know, of the internet age right. and how we get our message across. And and I might have been able to be a little bit more sympathetic if they had just come out and said, hey, we can't um, survive here any longer. We can only because you know, mm -hmm. there's there's a lot of competition right here in the South Bend area um, because there's not a lot of people and they still have all of these other places there's right you know, there's wings etc there's there's hooters there's buffalo wild wings um you know <clears throat> it's it's a lot all right there so you know is that really in their best interest to try to kind of push their model when all here i mean they could have just said look we have to leave here because there's too much competition and we can't survive right i would have understood but that's yeah. that's not yeah, what they yeah. that's not what they did <laughs> um the 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 wing place I go to is a mom and pop place. I I started going there when the previous owners who have now retired and one of them has passed away, you know, they're, they're probably in their eighties the third day. Um, and the former general manager of the place had bought the place with his, with his then, uh, with his then girlfriend, right. They both worked there and they bought the place. And um, <clears throat> I remember, you know, probably now 15 years ago, a Hooters moved in around the street around the corner and everybody's like, Oh, it's going to put this, put Lenny's out of business. And uh, he's like, no, it's not because we don't do what they do. Right. Right. And then Buffalo Wild Wings came and they went to the strip mall, you know, a mile away. And um, he's like, no. And then the, like, he would get concerned when there's a place called warrior tap house. It's a couple of vet, local veterans. They, they built this amazing little um, tap house and restaurant. They have a great chef, um, you know, 50 beers on tap. And they're, they just, they're really good citizens in the community. And um, he's like, I'm more worried about that. He goes, because the people that come here are more likely to leave and go support another local business. He goes, you know, my customer base is is set, right? And he makes all his own sauces and he's reactive to the community and things like that. Um, <clears throat> that when you, people go to Buffalo Wild Wings because, in chain restaurants in general, because, hey, I want to go watch sports. I'm out of town. Where do I go? Where's my consistency, right? People value consistency. And if a local place can be consistent, then they're going to win. Like when you go into, when I go into this place to watch football, for example, <clears throat> under the TV, you know, all the TVs, have, he'll have what two teams are on there. And then he's got sponsorships and local people I know, like do the drinking buddies of mine that own business stuff, they sponsor a television so that their home team can be on there. But you're not asking somebody to do it. You're like, hey, and it's a small, like it's, it's basically, it's, free advertising, right? Or near yeah. free advertising. Yeah. But it's um, it's a group of people that in most cases, if I looked at who's, who's sponsoring it, we've all been going there for going on 30 years now. And I think that, you know, I think the pandemic to me in, in how we've responded to it, and I don't want to get into, into the, how we responded to it, I think it's going to is put a focus on those types of businesses, I hope, to where people, when it, when it turns around, they're not just going to run back to big, big box mother store. Then they're going to go, well, wait a second. These guys were open and they did what they could do. Now you still have, you know, restaurants where, you know, you got people sitting outside trying to narc on restaurants for being, because they have their own personal views about what should be open or not. Those people, there's a special place in hell for you. And, you know, I'll see you there. Right. You know, I mean, cause then I'll be helping out. Um, but that's, you know, you talk about people that have, you know, persevered and positively look at like Guy Fieri, the celebrity chef on television. He, in, in a short period of time, he's raised over $20 million to help, you know, keep restaurant and service workers, you know, getting them something. Right. And, and I think, you know, when everybody, as we talk about the constitution and the government kind of segue into that, everybody focuses on, Hey, what, what's the government doing? 
Right? I think the hallmark of Americans and who we are as a giving, caring people up until probably recently has been, hey, how does how does the town, how does the society take care of itself? Right. And you look at I, I like to look at like, you know, the Mennonites, the Amish and stuff like that. How does that community, the barn raising effect? Right. I like to call it. Right. And, and what are we doing as a community um, to in the barn raising effect? But I can't I can't change everything. Right. My name. I don't have. You know, I'm not Bezos where I've got 200, 200 billion dollars and I can I can have large net effect on the on the world. Right. And one of those 150, 200 people that when you speak your money, you, the, the pile of money you sit on moves people to action. Right. And but that doesn't mean I can't do anything or as a community, we can't do anything. Right. And so the people that I want to hang out with are the people that sit around and go, I, you know, I can't I can't put the earth into a new orbit. But you know what? I can certainly make my part of the I can make my corner of the universe a better place than it was before. Absolutely. It, it gets into the thing where, you know, one ant can't build anything, but a billion of them could build a cathedral. Right. Yeah, that's a great, <clears throat> a great quote from Bull Durham. Yeah. Yeah. You and one, you, you put one, one ant can't do dick. You got to <laughs> build a cathedral. Right. Right. We in this, I, I, I hate to be the get off your not long guy, but, you know, that. Growing up, that's what people did. Like, you know, you went and helped people when they were in, in trouble. Now everybody turns around and goes, what's the government going to do? Right. And, and, and this is a, you know, getting back to that, that aspect of, of the community. You know, this is why I've started leaning much more heavily towards, you know, the capitalist anarchist, you know, m- m- theories, which is self-sustaining. You know, not right. anarchy, you know, anarchist, which is a little bit different. You bring that capitalist aspect into it. It's about how can we all have businesses that are local communities and support each other. Right. Um, because, and it's, it's really anti, you know, big box stores and, and, and to me, and that is, um, I, and I started becoming much more against them when I saw what they were doing here in COVID. I mean, they, oh. they, they have taken advantage of communities, uh, you know, every which way they possibly can, you know, they, they live a 100% by the motto of, stockholder value like they're only in business right. for stockholder value yeah, and yes shareholder value right you know and absolutely you you want to have that but it shouldn't be at the cost of the people in which you're supposed to be also serving and i think that that's they've they've lost sight of that and that's why i just i i you know outside of you know amazon because it's really kind of you know yeah, you know, they they do provide a convenience factor, and at one point they were small business. Right. Um, and I've been I've been a member and doing stuff with Amazon since they were just bookstore, you know, right. an online bookstore. Um, but you know, I'm not I don't I don't go to Walmart. I don't go to you know Target. Um, you know, I I tend to you know I will pay. I'm comfortable paying a little bit of a premium to the local business owners. No um, doubt. I, I, I'm, that's what I feel is I'm doing my part because I know that that look and that local business owner should be making good money. I mean, they've got a business and they got to pay their employees. They're so not a 501c3. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is... Yeah. They're, they're not a not for profit. Uh, you know, and I, I'd rather, I'd rather pay that premium there. Uh, I feel like that's a, you know, like with, with starting the distillery, I could absolutely buy grains and glassware and everything like that from a big, huge production and save a good amount of money. Right. Um, but then it has nothing to do with the community in which I'm serving. And I feel like that's just, well, I, I have to live my own principles. If I'm going to be a, a capitalist a anarchist, then I got to be able to, you know. Yeah, except for, when it comes to, <laughs> except for when it comes to my business, right? And then we yeah. can do in politics, right? Do what I say, not what I do. Yeah. The, the the local butcher that I go to, Pendulum Meats here in, in Norfolk, um, everything is sourced within 100 miles. And it's not that it's just that farm to table thing and everything like that. You know, it's like, you know, the pig, right? You know, you know, the cow that 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 was there. But um, there's such a vibrant artisan food community in the, in the Virginia Beach, Norfolk area that they all help each other. Like Three Ships Coffee is a great coffee purveyor here. Um, and when I go into Pendulum, they're selling three ships coffee. When I go into three ships, they've got, you know, the thing, they all met at the same, you know, farmer's markets type thing. And they, they, they start to work together. Um, and it becomes a, it becomes what we were right. Where, you know, is 
you know, your mom would send you down the street. And this is mostly for people that grew up in cities. Your mom would send you down the street to go get bread and thing. And, and that the owner of that business, if a child or a young child, you know, a young teenager couldn't translate what mom said, he knew or she knew what mom actually wanted and would get that in the child's hands and, and give it and send it back. Right. Um, and I, somebody's going to have to explain to me how you can't catch COVID to Walmart, but you can catch it in a mom and pop business. Well, you know, so I actually, you know, so right. Lisa, or, the, the recent studies show that people are, it's almost the 65%, something like that are getting it from based on the contact tracing that's out there from the big box stores. Well, and it's I, not, and it's not from the small restaurants. Right. No, I know that. And it, but am I, am I being facetious, right? But in general, oh, yeah, yeah. like if you're going to say one, how, my thing, and this goes back to where both of us tend to lean more libertarian is, you know, you start getting massive government intervention. Um, when anybody says they're here to help me, I, I, I don't care who it is. I'm like skeptical for the most part, uh, unless there's a big flashing red light on top of it. And there's a, you know, there's a caduceus on the side of a box with wheels on it. I'm going I'm to question whether you're actually here to help or not. Um, but this concept that we're picking and choosing winners, right? And that's really what you're doing. Right. You know, when, when we when what I, I think we're the other thing I think of that, the, and I don't think this is a good thing that the the, the I mean, outcry outpouring of the pandemic is there is much less trust in what the government says today than there was even nine months ago. Oh, absolutely. Right? Because there's been no transparency, because if a group of doctors says you have to do this and another group of doctors who are equally and eminently qualified says, no, that's not it. And that one group gets shouted down and marginalized. I want to know why. Right. And we're not, you know, so, you know, there's an economic impact to the things that come out of people's mouths and poor politicians. I mean, they can't help but get out of their way, whether it's, you know, Gavin Newsom. I mean, you, you got like, dude, you know, you you could have picked any restaurant. But when you go and you're sitting there with a restaurant like there's 10 people at that table. That's a fifteen thousand dollar meal you're having. That, that that's a good example of right. a bad example, but also of do as I say, not as I do. Oh no, I mean it's. But even on New Year's Eve, the mayor of New York City dancing in dancing in Times Square, or a block off Times Square with his wife. Right. I mean, it's like if nothing else, I I don't care if you're, I don't care if you're a you know a, 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 a little most most of these folks, they're just little despots. Right. They're you know it's like you're the kids that got your lunch money taken away from you when you were when you were a kid. Right. And now you're in a position where you, you can you can arbitrarily tell people what to do. There's no law behind it because the police can't enforce it. And yet people are buying into it. Right. Do I think covid is a, could be a very dangerous thing? Absolutely. Right. But do I think we have to have an, an, an honest conversation as to really what the dangers are and how that's transmitted and everything like that? I, even more. And but when you start taking folks that are. Like, dude, you just don't like, I just like, who's the, who is the communications person for all of these people going, Hey, you can't go do that. All right. And you have to understand in today's day and age, wherever you go as a public figure or a minor private figure, there's going to be somebody with a camera there that's more than willing to say, look what this person's doing. All right. And that's, I think, yeah. you know, but and, and now, and this is for me, kind of the natural segue. We, one thing, one amendment we really haven't covered that I want to get it before we move off to this topic into something else is the Tenth Amendment, right? And the Tenth Amendment states that anything that's not outlined in the Constitution or the amendments is the providence of the states, right? And states' rights has driven from the days of the writing of the Constitution um, has driven behavior, right? The reason that we have a house and a Senate and the rule, the, you know, this, the, the house is proportional and the Senate is not is, is largely that they couldn't figure out, like there was a struggle where Virginia, New York in particular and Pennsylvania wanted everything to be proportional. Why? Because they had the highest population and, you know, the Rhode Islands and Maryland's, they wanted it to be, uh, they wanted it to be equal because they had lesser population, but they wanted equal representation. So we we came up with a system and we and we split that right, um, but the federal government has figured out a way to 
try to impose, right? Because that's really all they can do. They can legislatively impose their will. And a lot of it is in the form of unfunded mandates. They require that states do things and they're willing, they're and they're not willing to pay for it. Or they say highway highway construction is a great example. And I'm not arguing whether we should have made the drinking age 21 or not. I'm just telling you how it was. When I was in high school, for the most part, the drinking age was 18, right? And through different circumstances, it was raised to 21. There were states that were lagging behind, right? In they were in the federal government's eyes not being compliant. Louisiana being one of them. And they finally said to Louisiana, go, look, it's 21 or we're never giving you another dollar for federal highway funding. So then every interstate was going to have to be funded by Louisianans, right? And so they can bully you with money into doing what doing what you want to be done. And so the even now, like hurricanes are a great example, or natural disasters are a great example. In one of the one of the provisions of of how we do business is if there's going, for example, when you had Hurricane Katrina, the federal government cannot in, impose or inject themselves into the problem unless the governor says, hey, I need help, right? That's a, and it's a tenant that goes back to the founding of who we are. Yep. Right? Once they raise their hand and say, pick me, then the full weight of the federal government and all the resources can be brought to bear to help battle the problem to save the citizens of pick a state, right? In Katrina, governor of Mississippi early and often said, hey, by the way, you guys feel free to come on down here. We, we're out of ideas. We're about ready to get pummeled. So let's see what we can do. Did they get hit hard? Yes. You know, they're within, they're co-located with Louisiana. Was the damages, the long-term effect is bad? No, because they, they asked for early and got, you know, and started pushing those resources into the state. In contrast, the governor of Louisiana did not do that. And then after the fact, wanted to blame the federal government, right? Is there politics involved? Always. There's politics and everything involved, right? But when you don't, do when you either don't do or you and I'm, there's two things either you didn't care or you didn't understand right those are the two things you, you didn't understand as a governor what your rights and responsibilities were to help help your citizens and what the full availability to you of the help meant or you didn't care right and both of those are unacceptable if you're an elected leader of a state right that when people want to have and it goes all the way to COVID they're like why didn't the president do this? Well, guess what? You know, the President Obama didn't cause the financial crisis of 2008. President Trump didn't cause COVID. There's no national, you, you can have national discourse about it, but the way we're set up is not for a national response like this, right? Because every state is different, right? And every, every locality is different. How New York City deals with it being a vertical city of tens of millions of people is a lot different than even Dallas, who's a, a huge city, but very horizontal and spread out. Right. So as a nation, we, we live in six time zones. We have everything from Arctic to jungle to desert to to island living. And we have 350 million, roughly, men, women and child that we have to deal with. And then we we take a healthcare crisis every bit of healthcare is state run, right? With, I mean, enterprise healthcare, I'm not talking Medicare, Medicaid, right? But everything is, is state run. It's one of the reasons that ACA has largely been effect, ineffective and is costing us more because we didn't remove the insurance model from what we were doing. We added a layer of federal bureaucracy and then hoped it was gonna be cheaper. I don't know how that works, but whatever limited math skills I have can't comprehend that, right? But that is at the heart of where people, oh, the president, when I mean, we've gotten this idea that over years, well, we elected the president, he's here to solve all our problems. We go back into the, into the founding documents by design, the power that the president actually has is the bully pulpit of the presidency. There's not, you know, it's not outlined. Really who's, who's criminally remiss in this for years is the House of Representatives. Because their job, they only have one effing job, and that's every year to show up and pass a goddamn budget that they can that can be voted on. When the president sends his requests, and he said the, every president, all forty five of them, they send requests to the House, right, and the Senate now because they, everybody has to have their hand in the pot. But they send requests to the House, 
and they say, hey, if you guys think a lot of this is okay, could you please include it in the budget? This is a priority to us, right? And that used to be a semi-coherent, collegial kind of way to debate, right? And I'm not on either side of the coin. Now, if a president sends something up to the Hill, the opposite, the opposing party, and both of both for all you people, the both parties are responsible for this. Everything's dead on arrival, right? And it's like it's like parents that start off with kids. Everything's no, and then you work your way back to a yes, right? And ineffective leadership 101 uh, right there. But that is really where we're at as a nation, folks, is people don't understand that Congress in in the House of Representatives in particular, in my opinion, has shirked their constitutional duty to provide a budget, right? And when you want to talk about big box stores, there's no more big box stores than Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Packy, Northrop Grumman, and everybody else. When you shut the government down, Khaki can take the $10 million hit a week. North the Grumman can take the $20 billion hit that they're going to take during the time it's shut down because they know that as soon as the money spigot opens up, they're going to get their money back because they're building capital systems of the line for the nation's defense. You want innovation in government and across the government. Don't shut the government down because that kills innovation because the small business can't survive without that lifeline to get there. Right. And we've tried, whether it's the Defense Innovation Unit and all these other F, uh, what is it, F, F-18 or F whatever it is at one. It was like the innovation hub that was downtown D.C. for a while that President Obama started, which I thought was a great idea because they brought like mid tier leaders from all the tech companies and said, hey, we want to make the process to innovation quicker in the government. And you and I have both been on the government long enough to know that's nice dream there, young man. Yeah. And good job. But. That to me is like when you start, people get antsy and uppity about what goes on in the federal government, be pissed off at your congressman, right? That's really where you need to show your ire because they have, they have a constitutional responsibility to provide a budget to have it voted on, right? And this continuing resolution and nickel and diming thing. And I, my, my new thing that I'm going to I'm beat the drum until I'm dead is any time that there's, a, there's an act, COVID relief is a great one. Look at everything that has nothing to do with COVID relief jammed into it, all right? I want to know which, which, which elected official or officials decided that would be a really good idea to put in there. Well, there's a lot, a lot of them do that. And, I, and, and the, the blame, like this, you know, a couple of things that you had, you had mentioned, and it's, you know, states' rights is a very important thing. I mean, that's the reason why it was in the, the Bill of Rights, the 10th you know, yeah. Amendment, <clears throat> is because especially when we look at today, the federal government, I, I do not believe ha- has I actually I believe the federal government has done exactly what they should be doing to here during COVID. They've gone into help with those states that have asked for help. Yeah. In states like New York and California, <clears throat> they thought they could handle it and they can't. And then they want to blame the federal government's response. Were, they're, were they're they, they think they could handle it, or would they do anything but ask the current president to help them? Uh yeah. I, mean, I think that's that's a better way of putting it, right? They're like, oh, I don't need your help because you're, you know, President Trump, and so we're going to take care of this on ourselves. Well, guess what? They can't. You know, there no no state really can. They don't have the true resources. They're the ones that have shut down, and this is why I am one hundred percent against any type of stimulus payment by the federal government. <clears throat> they, they, it's it's the federal government's job is to provide guidance, you know, oversight when asked. You know, even more so to get involved when when asked, but they didn't. The president did not tell anyone, "Shut down your business." No. And the, you know, even even with all that, the the states that are doing just because here's the thing, a, a lot of Americans are actually not out of work. We've we've transitioned to a remote workforce in almost yeah. everything, so. What, you know why? Why is the stimulus needed? I, I, I and and I, I'm, I'm against it. To be, I was against it the first time, and I'm against it this time. I don't believe it's the federal government's job to bail out uh, states' poor decisions. Well, I mean, the, the federal government's trying to. I think for me, the the one that gets me is um, student loan repayment. Yes, do we have trillions of dollars of student loan debt, and is it a problem? Absolutely. But how did we get the problem? The, the problem right now was caused by Congress. Yeah. Right. The only, for those of you that don't know, the only 
debt that you cannot discharge in a bankruptcy is student loan debt, right? So you, you take a, a, a large population that in my mind has largely been hoodwinked into that if you don't go to college, you're a dummy, right? That's number one, right? We've, we've gotten this thing that <clears throat> the stigma of not going to college, that you are a dumbass if you don't go to college, right? There's being educated and there's being knowledgeable people, right? Elon Musk said it best. You don't have to go to college. Everything you need to know is at your fingertips, except we watch cat videos all the time, right? Um, but to say that somebody else freely made a decision, right? The government didn't force you to take money, right? Period. The government did not force you to, more importantly, the government did not force you to pick the major you picked. Right. And this is where asking a 17 or 18 year old to basically obligate themselves for a, a lot of money <clears throat> is the problem. They don't have the foresight. And they, they have passion. Right. They have. Pa I want to learn this. I want to know this. I want to and I want to be thought of as knowledgeable and smart and everything. Well, how does what you're how does what you're obligating yourself to better prepare you to be employed? The only reason you go to college, folks, what is well, two reasons. One, you learn how to learn. And I think parents say you can make a lot, learn how to make a lot of adult decisions in a semi-autonomous environment that's relatively controlled. But you're ultimately there to make yourself more marketable to the workforce, right? <clears throat> and whether we like it or not, for the most part, <clears throat> a university education or even starts in high school. It's not about giving people a spirit of knowledge and thought and innovation <clears throat> and wanting to change the world. It's about creating a class of workers. Right. And selling them on white picket fence, mortgage, getting, you know, all of those things. Right. That right there drives this behavior. I, I use you as an example, Dan. You've talked about the student loans you've taken in the past. And you're like, every decision I make is about how much is this? What's the ROI on the investment I'm going to make? Right. I'm going to invest in going, getting a doctorate. Why? Because I can see I'm here financially if I don't have it. I'm here financially if I do have it, and I'm, I'm willing to take that risk because I know it's negligible because I know most all of the contributing factors that will make me successful or not. Same with going to business school, right? It, those are things, but, and I've, you know, if, you have, if you're going to get a degree in art history, good on you, but understand what the limitations are of what you can make, right? And say, I'm gonna take, in, in order to get a job, as an art historian, you largely have to have a master's degree. And so you're going to, if you don't put any of your own cash in, $130,000, $150,000, depending on where you go to school, to get that art history degree, the master's, to get a $60,000 a year job. And then you're going to put yourself in a position to do what? Have a, what, twelve dollars to $1,500 minimum payment a month and try to do that on $60,000 and have an apartment, have a car, have a lifestyle, and do everything else. It's an impossible task, right? But now to say that <clears throat> folks that saved for their college kid, their kids' college education or folks that went in the military, right, or that agreed to go work for the Peace Corps, public, you know, all the avenues where you can say, hey, I want a free education. How do I go earn it, right? You're going to say that because I saved for my child's education and that I saved for my child's education and that an example of my son that where do I where do I get that money back? All right. You, what you're saying is you want to make you're advocating to you're not advocating to rid student debt. You're ad, advocating to make college free. All right. One of the biggest problems with California is the state university system of California used to be what for for California residents. Well, basically free. There was yeah, and that's part of their debt problem, right? People get on Harvard and some of the I. I Harvard is a unique for me as a unique um, Harvard is a, is a, is a, is a classic study in the economics of education. All right. First off, and it, this goes for people that are on subsistence tonight, people do not take care of things to which they do not own. All right. If somebody gives you a car thing. I, when I was a kid, my dad, my parents would give me bicycles, right? When I was 13 years old, after a paper route, I bought my own bicycle. Guess what? That, that bicycle is probably still around today. Right, because I had, to, I had to contribute to, I bought it with my own money and I didn't want it to get damaged. Why? Because I knew how much, it, I, knew, I knew how long it took me to make that money. 
right? Even as a 13 year old. Harvard, with the endowment that they have, could send every kid to school free for Harvard for the next hundred years, right? But they don't, and I don't, and I don't advocate that they should. I think tuition there's like 78 grand a year now, right? Which we can say is just crazily insane because you're committing 300 plus thousand dollars just in tuition to get a kid a bachelor's degree. If your family, if your AGI is I think 90 or less, that child goes there for free. And then it's a graduated tuition payment based on 91,000 and moving forward, right? That I think, and then it's just like anything else. It's like health insurance. You know, you get a bill back and it says, hey, it was a billion dollars to this, but you know, we your health insurance negotiated it down to $12. Well, it's an accounting trick that the, it helps keep the insurance company from having to pay wild taxes because, oh, we, we cut all this off the price. We lost money, all this stuff. And they didn't lose anything. It's just the, the economics of the economics of healthcare, the economics of education with schools with big endowments like Harvard work to a, work to a place that Bill Gates's kids aren't going to pay anything to go there. Well, they will, but it's because he would endow the school with some more money. Right. right. And so there's a truth like, Oh, they're going there for free. <clears throat> no, not. He gave much more money in the tuition to get a name on the side of the building or do, you know, do the things that wealthy people have always done. Um, along the way, right? When when we talk about the separation is not at those schools. Is it the mid-tier schools that don't cost much less, but subsequent to this widespread availability of, um, of, of college loan money have jacked up the tuition and, and, and to a point now where it is. You're not allowing a child to even have the wherewithal to really change a major and have to stay an extra semester because of the cost. Right. I think that, you know, but again, when it comes down to it, when we start talking federal loan forgiveness or student loan forgiveness, what what's the what are you what's the message you're sending to the general public? Hey, just go out there and run up debt. The federal government will eventually get around to taking care of you. Right. That's yeah. the bad precedent. It, it is. Not it is. Americans. Yeah, and and I think you know you you touched on this earlier, you know the and this is you know because so, so we will finish up the you know the overall the constitution aspect and that the problem is not with the constitution the problem is with the politicians it's the it's the democrats and the republicans you yeah. get rid of all of them blow up both of those parties and you know start with some some new ones and um, maybe we can get some things done. But you know this is the, the the great part about the constitution is that it is a living document. It has changed a bunch of times. 27 you know, to be exact. Right. <clears throat> and, and I'll quickly go through some of the, I think, the important ones. You know, uh, Amendment 12, which is redefining of how the Electoral College was on. It literally took, you know, Section 3 of the Constitution and, and rewrote it. Um, then another, another great example to me is, in, and it took them, let's see, where, where is that? The Senate? That's the Senate. Um I had all these things, you know, right there. But basically, let's see, it was, I thought, I thought it was 19 that got the right to the citizens of it, uh, which is the one that uh, outlawed liquor. Ah, uh, 18. 18. So um, 18 was ratified in 1919. And we came to our senses um, 1933? In, in 1933. So, you know, 15 years. Um, is you know what it basically took to get this thing done. Um, we go, yeah, you know, maybe we shouldn't have uh, you know made liquor. You can't, you can't legislate common sense and morality. That's what the 18th and the 23rd Amendments were about, right? Exactly. Right? But so, but look at the larger picture of this. Now people want to, via legislative caveat, usurp the Constitution, right? Because oh, it just takes forever. It's hard, and they're what you do is you. You basically marginalize the founders, so then you can marginalize the document. But we've proven that with pretty, you know, it was easy to outlaw liquor. It was relatively easy to get it back, right? That even when, even when, as a people, we're viewed to have made a mistake constitutionally, we have an effective means to remedy that, right? And this is where... You know, hey, if you're not teaching the founding documents in, in high school in particular, and then certainly when you move into college, you know, they require you to take two semesters of English, right? 
Well, let's, you know, let's take something on how the federal government works or how the Constitution, what the founders intent was. Right. And not through the prism of, oh, that guy was a slave owner. Well, everybody back then was. Right. right. Pretty much. Right? <clears throat> and even if you read the Declaration and some of it, 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 there's a lot more about ridding the country of slavery in there than not. Right? Absolutely, there was, and that's that's the hard, you know, every, you know, in terms of like as a people, like the arc of history, every country has an original sin, right? The Brits were colonialization, you know, in particular their relationship with India, right? Um, and ours was slavery, right? And so, is we, you know, especially now in these really charged times, do we deal with it by ignoring it? Right. When you start pulling down statues. Of, now, first of all, I don't understand putting up statues of people on the losing team. Right. And that's the whole Confederacy. Like, but are we yanking them down? Are we yanking them down because they were bad people? Or are we yanking them down because we want to remove the we want to remove our thoughtfulness about history? Right. And you hear me say this all the time. I want the Ku Klux Klan on television every night talking because the more they talk, the more people go, hey, we got to stop that. Right. That's completely out of step with what goes on on the planet. Right. If you put that in the darkness, it will fester and come back to, into the light a way that, in a way that you've never contemplated and certainly don't want. Yeah. Right. And- and, 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 you know, with that, which is, again, you know, b- b- back to slavery and, and that original sin, um, Lincoln basically said that the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution are, you know, the Constitution was just the next iteration, basically, of our Declaration of Independence. And, you know, through, through Amendment 13, the 13th, uh, which was to abolish slavery. Uh, right. You know, it, you know which... So through the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, you effectively right right the wrongs of proportional proportional humans yep right? and then and then then our 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 leadership aspect which is I, why I don't know why it took so long for us as a country to understand this because one of the most important things you need to do as a leader is develop your secession plan you know in the event that you know I'm going to leave at some point my job I need someone to be able to take my place right the 25th amendment lays out the United States secession plan of power um, in the event the president can't do his job, in the event that the and, president is removed from office. Tell everybody what year that amendment was ratified. 1967. Yeah, more than an hour after we formed as a nation. Yep. You know, someone right. said, hmm, we should probably really lay this out so everyone knows what's going to happen in the event we have, uh, you know, some a couple of things, you know, occur, which you would think, Right after Lincoln was assassinated, you might want to start, you know, really laying out the secession plan at that point. You know, <laughs> you know, I don't know, but that's kind of the way I looked at it. Uh, and you know, the you know the, the the funny one to me, of course, is the is the last one, the Twenty Seventh Amendment, which was first originally proposed in 1789 and got ratified in 1992, which is no law varying the compensation for the services of the senators and representatives shall take effect. Until an election of representatives shall have been intervened. <laughs> Basically, you can't vote for your own race, right? <laughs> right, and you know it's not, like, there's a lot of things like that go on in life where you're like, why do we have to have a rule for that, right? Why the military is a great thing. Like we, when everybody, anybody wants to know why there's a policy for or against something, especially when you can't do something, it's usually because somebody like you, like why would anybody ever do that? Why do we need to have a? Why do we have a rule for that? Well, because somebody thought it'd be a really good idea to do that when it wasn't. And so now we have to outline it. Right? Yep. And that, you know, voting <clears throat> for yourself. But think about this. And we were talking about this before we went on air. As we start trying to jump into the into presidents and talking about all things presidential historian or history, rather, I started looking at the Wikipedia page for all the presidents. And um, first off, when I was a kid, you kind of had to know who the president was. Right. In his life, it started like in, I think, you know, sixth, seventh grade, you started, to, you know, they started with the big ones. Then you kind of worked your way down to the minor presidents. Then you it's somewhere along the way you got to Millard Fillmore and everybody was asleep. And you're like, OK, I don't care. That guy didn't do anything. Thing. But what I noticed, and it's great that Wikipedia lays it out for you so you don't really have to do the digging, is how many how many presidents served a, 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 a large portion or all of their presidency without a sitting vice president? 
Can you imagine that today? No, I, I can't. <laughs> conversation, like, well, okay, who's going to take their place, right? And then the Twitter sphere starts with all that stuff and everything like that, right? But you're like, nah, I'm just not going to do it. I don't think we need another guy. What happens if you die? I don't know. It's we don't have the twenty. We don't have that amendment yet. So I, yeah, somebody, I, I can do whatever I want, right? That to me stands out. Whether you talk about good presidents, bad presidents, and everything in between, right? Um, but y- you have it starts with. Yeah, like, I, I guess I would, I would go I would on the record. If you chose to not have a vice president, then you could not have been a good president. Well, you like, may not Madison. have been a horrible president, right? <laughs> James Madison was president from 1809 to 1817. And he he had a he basically did not the only time he had a, a vice president in those in those eight years was between April 20th of 18,000 or 1812 and then 18 November 23rd of 1814. Right? He didn't like the rest of it. Then you go, uh, Andrew Jackson. He had, he inherited John Calhoun from John Quincy Adams, and then it was vacant for a few years. Then he had Martin Van Buren. Now, are we going to say that he put Martin Van Buren in there because he wanted that person to be the next president? I don't. We'd have to dig into the history behind it. But that's this not having a sitting vice president today just became fascinating to me. And over the now, that's where it'll be my new thing to start looking around. Yeah, it would be interesting to see why, because you know for. For those that don't know, at one point in time, we, you know, we actually voted for the president and the vice, and the president, vice president independently, right? right? Well, and that, I think it was with Jefferson, right? Whoever won got to be the president. Whoever came in second got to be the vice president. Right. Right. right? So, yeah, exactly. And so, you know, with that, you didn't necessarily, you know, get to pick your, you know, who your team was going to be, you know? So <laughs> why, was, why was us electing, why was that method of first place, second, gold medal, silver medal, why was that, why could that be hugely important if it was two different parties? Well, so, I mean, today I would think because then we would have to, you know, actually utilize diplomacy and proper negotiation in order to get things done. Well, you know, no, but even, even more, more simple than that. And this is part of, you know, Constitution 101. What is the prime function of the vice president of the United States? Oh, so, well, oversees the Senate. He's the president of the Senate, yeah. right? And so if you get to a position where you've got a 50-50 Senate, kind of like we're probably headed for right now, um, that becomes that position becomes hugely important. Yep. Well, if one of them is a Democrat, the other one's a Republican, and you roll in there, now, now it, it, what it, it does encourage negotiation, but it doesn't occur, encourage it with the with the um, with the executive branch. It encourages it within the legislative branches, so they get to a point where they don't have to have mom and dad come in and intervene. Right. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. I mean, you look at like John um, John Tyler, uh, no vice president. Millard Fillmore, no vice president. And if you're part of the Whig party, you know we know we know how that worked out for you. Um, Franklin Pierce had a vice president for a couple hours. Uh, Andrew Johnson, after Lincoln was assassinated, never had a vice president throughout the entirety of his corrupt presidency. Um, Ulysses S. Grant, last two-ish years of his presidency, no vice president. Um, Chester Arthur, great, great sideburns and mustache president. Um, no, no vice president. Grover Cleveland had a vice president for, you know, a, a cup of coffee. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> once a year, right. Um, and we're in, we're literally, we're on the dawn of a new century at this point. McKinley, part of his term, no vice president. Roosevelt showed up with no vice president. Um, uh, Howard, Ta- William Howard Taft, most of his presidency, not thing. We're into deep into the 1900s, right. Calvin Coolidge vacant for the first, um, First couple, three years of his presidency. Harry Truman, no vice president. I mean, Harry Truman, we're talking post-World War, you know, we're talking World War II. He had no vice president when he showed up. Right? From so from the time that he took office till the time he got freely elected on his own, he had no vice president during World War II and the aftermath of World War II. I to me, that's fascinating. I want yeah. to know more. I want to know why. I want to know why. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, you know, they'll put like Lyndon Johnson, it was. He it was vacant, but it was from actually it was longer than I thought. Wow, he, we had no sitting vice president 
from November 22nd of 1963 through January 20th of 1965, right, in my lifetime, they didn't think it was a good idea. All right, don't start yeah. in my lifetime goes back to the founding fathers. Joe. Yeah. Uh, no. yeah, in your lifetime, you've had a lot of presidents that have a vice president there. Right. <laughs> but you, you know, like you look in the aftermath of, of Watergate and Nixon, there wasn't, a, for, a, for a small period of time, a couple of months, there wasn't a president, um, there wasn't a vice president, right? And you know, at that point, now it's a congressional negotiation about how we're going to, how we're going to do that. This type of thing is what spawned the succession plan. Yep. It didn't, plan, it didn't do it because, because Millard Fillmore didn't have a vice president. Because yeah. obviously if they did, it would have been done before the Civil War. It's when you get to a modern TV watching public where reporters are going, hey, who are you going to have for vice president? Right. That's really what it took. Right. And when for people that want to talk about the media, when they talk about the fourth estate, that was always in America. The great part of the media at the time was to come in and ask those questions that needed to be asked, not to not to advance an agenda for one side or the other. And yes, right. everybody has their favorites and their stories of reporters. I mean, here's the thing. If and this is a great it's a quote from a movie. I can't remember which one. But in 1933, if Americans, every American has a TV in their home, we don't elect a president in a wheelchair. Right. We don't. And, pre and every every reporter, every media person effectively covered up for I think everybody in the in that was involved, it covered up for the fact that that Franklin Delano Roosevelt was in a wheelchair. Right. Everybody <clears throat> covered up for the fact that Kennedy's back was shot and that he was taking narcotics and stuff like that to manage that. Did that make him any less effective? I don't know. Did it limit his effectiveness? Maybe. Probably. Right. Because for those of you that live with chronic pain. Whether you think it's affecting you or not, it is, right? But you start looking, and I mean, you're we're talking. It's only been the last, um, you know, the last six presidents where we've decided that we can't go without having a vice president anymore. Absolutely, right? And, and so you know, so with all that, TK, who who is the, in your opinion, the worst president of all time? Here's the thing, I I, I don't have. I, it's not one. Right. And it's not that here's the thing. Nobody is absolutely corrupt and nobody is absolutely pristine. Right? Of course. Well, of course. In order to in, in life. Right. That, that's the thing. But especially to get to the presidency, the, the amount of compromise you have to make in your life to achieve is staggering. Right. You look at you look at presidents like Woodrow Wilson. Right. My mind. Terrible president. Absolutely, absolutely agree. Absolutely terrible president. He, he he's the one that is my 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 worst. So you know it's funny that because we didn't you know for those of, we didn't collaborate on which ones are going to be our bottom right. right? <laughs> so first the, the the bridge named after him in D.C. is what my, my number one reason is why he's a horrible president. So worst bridge to go. <laughs> uh, second, he created the income tax. He literally is what put the IRS uh, on the map for us. So well, it's not just that <laughs> he was a horrible bigot and racist. Yes. He, he I, absolutely was. He segregated the federal government um, even more so, and he well, went out of his time, way. The federal government was at the, at the time the federal government was on it was leading the way to, to integrate. Yep. Right. It, it places the far reaching at the time, and he's like, no. Yep. Exactly. And he wanted to, and he said it in public, and nobody held him accountable for it. He wanted to get rid of all people of color from the federal government. Yep. And more. More importantly, and then he created the Federal Reserve, which also well, I was, there we go. That's it. He <laughs> created the Federal Reserve, or he allowed the Federal Reserve to be created, right? Because that's really he didn't create the Federal Reserve, right? J.P. Morgan had a hand in that. You know, you start oh, yeah. all the big money people, right? <clears throat> but he was the first globalist. Yep, yep. Right, and you know, wanted his legacy to be the League of Nations and all that thing and, and that stuff like that. Again, president got us into World War One. Right. Yeah. That, you know, very, you know, thing. But he is he's a he was a vile human being who everybody would say that for the last few years of his presidency, Edith Galt, his wife, was actually the president. Yeah. yeah. Right. And it, again, media, everybody, everybody hid that. He wouldn't show up for press conferences. Somebody else would. And nobody thought to ask, where's, what's he doing? Oh, we don't see him out on the golf course. So where's he at? He's not on the back chipping and putting. He's not, he's not, you know, things that didn't exist in, in 1913, the, the White House bowling alley, right? Yeah. He's not there. Yeah. Number one, didn't exist, right? But 
we didn't, you know, we, we start looking at that, right? I joke around about, um, <clears throat> about Millard Fillmore and some of the presidents in the 18, 1800s after the big three or four at the beginning and then before Lincoln. Right. Right. Those um, were largely ineffective presidents. I mean, they didn't, they, well, didn't have, they didn't have anything to do. We were an ineffective nation, right? We were just, yeah. we were a nation of agrarian dumbasses that was trying to find our way. Yep, absolutely. Right? And, and, we, and the, the federal government wasn't empowered with money or anything else. The states were supremely powerful at the time. If you were the governor of Virginia, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, New York, you, 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 were, a, you were a man of power, right? You could yeah. get things yeah. done nationally. Right. And there's absolutely, you know, and um, I, I'm a it's funny because we and we we've talked about this before. I think that I think that Franklin Roosevelt um, largely he was ineffective. Yeah, I, I, I have I have FDR as my as the second worst president. Um, and a lot of people say, oh, he, he was great. I'm like, one, th th imagine this today. OK, he rounded up you know, a hundred thousand plus Asian Americans and said, eh, I think it's a good idea to kind of put you in some camp. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't break any laws. It was because of the color of their skin and the way they looked right. and because of World War II going on. We're just going to go ahead and, you know, round these people up. Actually, Imagine say it like this. And this is it, when people want to ask me how racism is allowed to fester and foster in the U.S., right, even today. Right. <clears throat> when you look at um, and people say, well, you know, African-Americans, everybody else has risen up above it. You know, because if you look at the migration of the 19, early 1900, when the Irish showed up, they couldn't get jobs. They were treated like crap. People, they were marginalized and everything like that. Then the Italians and then so on and so on from the from the European migration. But they quickly assimilated for a number of reasons. One, um, like my my ancestors came from the you know, what now is the Czech Republic and Germany and everything like that. And. My uncle, Charlie, his name was actually Vasily. But when he got to Ellis Island, somebody wrote Charlie because they didn't know how to spell Vasily. And he was happy to be Charlie in America. So there's that factor, right? Yep. But when you start looking at people of color or ethnic minorities, one of the reasons that all of those groups of Western European migration were allowed, were afforded the opportunity to jump into the mainstream of society, and become productive members of society, was because as long as they didn't talk, they could walk around the country and nobody would know whether they were born in America or born in Italy a week beforehand. Right. Right. When you look at World War II and certainly the effort in now, Roosevelt could have stopped it. I'm not sure that, like I said, pro presidents get all the blame and they get all the glory. He has to take the responsibility or historically the responsibility of interning the Japanese Americans has to be laid at the feet of Franklin Roosevelt. He's not the one he there was a law passed. Right. There was a, 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 you know, an executive of all of these things to go do it. Why did we round up a buttload of German Americans and put them in camp? No. Why? Because they look like us. Right. They looked like the European America that we were becoming and that we had emanated from. Yep. Right. And even today. Right. People say, hey, well, you walk into a room, if everybody's sitting there quietly. I don't know whether I don't know whether a person in the room is actually Italian. You think. But, you know, when it's an African-American, you know, when it's an Asian-American, you know, when it's Hispanic. Yep, absolutely. Right. They look different, you know. And and here's right. the thing, you know, FDR. People want to say he was an absolute racist, you know. He uh, after the Olympics in 1936, he invited every uh, medalist winner that, that was, was American really. except Jesse Owens. Yep. Um, he opposed, uh, or he was in favor of anti, you know, lynching legislation. Like he didn't want to put it in out there at all. Uh, and then he yeah. nominated he, Hugo Black. He was favor of anti-lynching anti legislation, but he certainly wasn't against it. Yeah. You know, right? He, he nominated what? Hugo Black to the Supreme Court. He was an active member of the KKK. Yeah. Active. Yeah. Well, you know, when, you start looking at, when you start looking at the Civil Rights Act, right? The original Civil Rights Act, I think it was the Civil Rights Act of 1957, got shot down like a low-flying duck in Congress, yeah. right? And a lot of it was... You look at the judges that were on the court and certainly at the appellate and the lower levels of the courts, they were judges that were appointed by Franklin Roosevelt. And some like Mississippi, I think it was three. I'm, I'd, I'd have to go back and look, but I think it was three judges, justices that were from the from the deep south. And they're like, basically, hey, yeah, this is not going anywhere. It's not as long as I'm alive. Yeah. Right. 
And it took, and if you look at the federal, the Civil Rights Act of 1965, the language is almost identical as what was in 1957. It's just by that point, what did we, what was the difference in time? Jackie Robinson. No, how many people had a fucking television in their house? Yeah, exactly. It, it, right? All of a sudden, now you know we transitioned from radio to you know to, to TV, or at least that transition was was certainly happening. But, you know, it, I, but my personal opinion, like we can talk about bad presidents, but when you talk about in a, in turning um, in turning Americans because of the way they look or like that today, in you disagree with me if you would like America, I don't care. The single most damaging thing to America is hyphenated Americanism. Yep, absolutely. We're an African American, we're an Italian American, we're a thing. No, we're Americans, right? And just because we have different skin colors, we, are, we have a, a national heritage that started in another country, doesn't mean you're not Americans. For those of you that haven't traveled extensively, that's the gift of traveling, right? If you don't want to be ignorant, read. If you don't want to be a racist, travel. Right. Absolutely. I was in Kosovo years ago and my driver every day would be talking about America, America, America. I was a, a trained engineer, an electrical engineer. Uh, and he was making more money driving a driving a car for us. than he could be making an engineer in Kosovo at the time. And so one of the days I said, Paya, every day it's America, America. Right. Why? You're European. Why don't you go to Germany and become a citizen? Why don't you go to Britain? He goes, because if I go to Germany and become a citizen, I'll never be a German. If I go to the UK and become a citizen, I'll never be British. Only in America, when you show up and become a citizen, are you an American, right? And so in hyphenating Americans, you'll say, oh, you're trying to rid people of culture. No, I'm not. I grew up in the suburbs of Boston. If you wanted to go eat Italian food, you knew, you knew which neighborhood to go ahead. We celebrated every culture, and largely because most cultural celebrations revolve around what? Food. Yeah, absolutely. Right? And so you would go from neighborhood to neighborhood th throughout the year and celebrate. And, it, and everybody was involved in it. And you were, you know, like the Feast of St. Anthony's coming up in our people like, you know, wagging their tails, getting excited about it. Right. And you celebrated everybody's culture. Right. And you made it American. Like if you look at the way we serve spaghetti sauce and all those things, that's not how Italians make it. Right. True, Ita true Italians. But it's our version of it. And it's to celebrate another culture. It's we do that with Asian food. We do it with everything else. Right. But. <clears throat> We value diversity in America in everything except each other. Oh, uh, well, well said. Well said. Right. We want, I don't want to eat the same food every day. I don't want to go to the same movies. I want to, I want diversity in my workouts. I don't want to work the same job for the rest of my life, but hey, you look different than me. So we're not going to, we can't get along. Right. And I've hyphenated your Americanism. Right? Yeah. I, I think hyphenating you know, our Americanism, you know, not, it, it really mm -hmm. now, it, it really takes away from what America, the vision that our founding fathers had for what America was to be. Right. It, it, here's a here's a news to all here, to all all p all all groups that have been segregated, right? and we're all been segregated, right? Whether you're a 55 year old white guy and above, whether you're an African American, everybody's segregated. Why? Into a voting population. And if one pol political group or another looks at your hyphenated Americanism, pick whichever one it was, as a voting block, they're bad people. Yep, absolutely. It's true. Because you're not looking at, you're not saying, hey, I want to make America better. You're saying, I want to win. Mm. Right? right. And that's the problem. Yep. So uh, getting back <clears throat> to FDR, um, what he did to the Jewish people during uh, prior to World War II is another reason why I say he was bad. You know, imagine today we Listen. have a ship of 900 plus Syrian refugees and President Trump says, nope, sorry, you can't come here. Yeah. Well, that's what FDR did uh, with the uh, MS St. Louis, which had 900 some Jewish people. Uh, and then, then I'll get into the next part of it. You know, his you know new deal sucked. Okay, yeah. you know, I think it, it prolonged uh, the, the, the depression as well as, I mean, imagine today if we had an unemployment rate of 15%, they would be calling for any president's head. If we had that, that rose of, uh, you know, FDR's lowest during his tenure was 14.7%, but at the majority of it was at 19%, almost one in five Americans not having a job. I mean, and of course he increased the taxes to be, you know, 
you know, the reason why you know we had so many people unemployed was because when you increase the burden on companies and people to have you know a, an effective of seventy percent tax rate, you're you're not going to have innovation, and you're not going to hire people. You well, know, you're also not having the incentive to work because if I've got to give up almost three quarters of everything I make to somebody else, why am I showing up every day? Yeah, it's just you know it's it's not it's not effective, you know. So Roosevelt, you know, that like the New Deal was the first and. It was the first grand attempt to federalize the U.S. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. And that's really and make and make Americans dependent on the federal government. Right now, in in a crisis such as the Great Depression, should there have been early on more subsistence? And but we had no. There was if you look at um, <clears throat> Herbert Hoover and every president prior to him. There was no roadmap. There was no, if you're not, you know, you'd have to have been a complete visionary to figure out what we're going to need to do that. Right. And, um, and, and how we helped people was different back then. Right. There was a lot more reliance on community, right. Community groups, whether they're faith-based or not, however you look at it, there was a lot more reliance on that. But the, the moves of Roosevelt in particular um, were largely to help to federalize the U S government yeah, and that, make people dependent on that yeah the packing of the supreme court all those things and then you know he also went <clears throat> against to you know the tradition because it was not you know an amendment at the time uh, but he went against the tradition by running for the third term right but that's again you in order to and even i would say even back then but in order to and i'll say the one exception to this it probably at the time was jimmy carter but in order to become the president or want to become the president of the United States, there's an incredible amount of hubris and ego that you have to exhibit, right? Because it, that's a, mon it's a, it, people don't understand the level of just, there has to be of effort that has to be exerted to want to do this, right? And the level of compromise you have to make in order to be on the world stage, right? Like that. And some people rise to that occasion. Some people don't. And then some people say, hey, we're, you know, I got a, I got a phone and a pen. I can do whatever I want. Right. And we can go from there. Yep. You, you know, <clears throat> even even you look at a president like Eisenhower. But I think he was a great transitional president. You know what I mean? He'd be basically, hey, the engines of the economy and more importantly, being around to really help facilitate us becoming the dominant player on the world stage. And at the time, and people forget this, at the time, we were loved for that. Yeah. Right? As, an, as a nation, we were loved for that because we didn't come in and impose our will um, and say, you have to be like us. Right? I think the one place that we've done that correctly in the last probably 40, 50 years, certainly, you know, we, from Vietnam on, we, we've not done a good job of, of coming in and liberating people we come in and we tend to be long-term occupiers at least financially was kosovo and the kosovo people for the most part love us for it because they've had so many people come in so many countries come in over the years and say we're going to be your liberators and they actually become their occupiers right and it's one of the reasons when you go everywhere that in in kosovo they love us as americans because we we didn't do the overreach right and um <clears throat> to the point where you know you i you George Marshall, he, I think it was his, I think his, his anniversary or something. I was reading something about him the other day. And if you look at me, he, he was the chief of staff of the Army during World War II. Right? He knew how to pick leaders. That was his thing. Right? Because at the time, there was, you know, there was no Department of Defense. It was the War Department. Right, right. You know, the Navy Department. It was a very, very ad hoc relationship that they had to work together. But he knew how to pick leaders. Right. He knew that in circum circum certain circumstances, you needed a warrior diplomat like Eisenhower. In other circumstances, you needed somebody that was willing to walk around with blood on their boots, but get the job done in patent and everything in between. Right? He knew there was a place for a bombastic, hardline personality like Curtis LeMay. Right? They, to understand aerial power and what the might of aerial power could do to change the course of history. Right? <clears throat> and then after the war... He was what? He was the Secretary of Defense. He was the Secretary of State, right? And he largely presided over what at the time, and I think should be considered one of the seminal pieces of foreign policy in the, in the Marshall Plan, 
right? One of the reasons that we that that World War II and the Germans acted the way they acted in the wake of the Versailles Treaty was because of the Versailles Treaty. And who was the big proponent of the Versailles Treaty? Say it out loud. <laughs> Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson. Yeah. Right? That was his seminal piece. Basically, let's jam it to the Germans to where they can't function as a people and they don't have any national pride. Yep. Right. When you look at all the Bavarian empires, that they that was the one thing they functioned on more than anything else was national pride. And you took the one thing they needed away from them. And right. then you but, wondered why over the course of 20 years. Why the uh, Nazi party was able to come. Right. Why the, why the despot that was this what became the, the, you know, came and rose to power, right? Because when you, yep. when people don't have hope, when you truncate hope, you get bad behavior, right? In, in, in looking at Eisenhower in particular, he shepherded us out of the war and had the supreme confidence of the American people to say, here's how we need to move away from this, right? And, you know, as, you know, but even even he ignored the elephant in the room, which and he tried to think, but he didn't he didn't use the bully pulpit of the presidency to win on race. Right. He said, that'll nah, be the next guy's job. I, mean, I put it out there and he, he legit. If you read his writings, he wanted to integrate America the way that the, the military had been integrated in his lifetime. Right. Because he had seen what happens when, you know, Americans fight next to each other, no matter what they look like. Right. Because we're fighting for a common thing. Right. And that what common thing do we have now to fight for? Right. We have a lot, but the media would leave you to believe that everybody acts in their own interest. Yeah. Because right. it's, it's easy to, to it's easy for the media to, to do that because people only tend to go to one source of information. Right. And that becomes their seminal source. And it's you know, they they have forgotten or actually I wouldn't say they've forgotten it, it they we have become lazy as a nation in that we only want to be around people who look like us think like us talk like us uh and they don't want that diversity of thought because it's hard and right. and we continue that path and this is why we have such polarizing opposites of the Republicans on the far right and the Democrats on the, on the far left. Right. And, right. and it's, and, there, and we don't have a whole lot of people on that middle ground anymore. And, we and because of elected officials and everybody in the middle is like going, Holy, Holy good, good, you know, good googly moogly. What do, how do I vote? What do I vote for? Right. Right. You know, Ben Shapiro said not too long ago on one of his shows, you know, because someone asked when is he going to run for uh, you know, an elected office? He said at one point he wanted to now, no way. Um, yeah, he says yeah, there there because the amount of just <clears throat> uh, utter you know shenanigans that go on to get, become elected, you know, he's like I wouldn't want to put myself, my family, um, through that type of uh you know aspect of the media. I'm just not going to do it. But why doesn't he make a good candidate? Um, why does he not? Well, yeah. today he wouldn't necessarily make a good candidate because of how you know because he he talks what he believes to be the truth. Well, um, he, he, he has much like Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton was a terrible candidate because she didn't have. Wait, any, we already have an opinion. We already have an opinion. We didn't. She didn't have any undecideds, right? Yeah. Even these great candidates that come out of the woodwork uh, every four years, and all of a sudden you're like, man, that, this is very presidential, right? There's not a, a trail of public utterings that um, that the media can get a hold of, right? right? It's why um, it's why this it's why the media doesn't like nominees of the Supreme Court that weren't justices, that, of, that weren't judges somewhere else, right? Because you can go be a law professor. You can, actually, you don't even have to be a lawyer to be on the Supreme Court. But no. um, that you, you're, if you, let's say you appointed a senator, right? They don't have legal opinions. They have how they voted on legislation and how they've run their mouth. Yep. Right? We want legal opinions. And I don't care what party you are. Don't be surprised when a when a conservative president puts a conservative person up to be nominated for the Supreme Court or a liberal does the same thing. It's what we've asked for as a people. Right. That's you know, that literally is what we've asked for. Yeah. Right. So we haven't asked to have strong constitutional scholars. We've asked to get people on the court that can be nominated and affirmed. And we've we've said, hey, be on your side of the center. 
when you think. But as we've seen now, you know, just because I think President when President Bush appointed Justice Roberts in particular, they're like, oh, it's going to be a conser- conservative court forever. And as other more moderate, you know, seem to be more moderate justices have left the court, you've either put people that are considered much more liberal or much more conservative on the court. But it's still not a, a six to three conservative vote like, like some of the media would have you believe. Right. Justice Roberts in particular, because he drives the train on what cases appear before the Supreme Court as a chief justice. And he has now become the swing vote on quite a bit of legislation. Absolutely true. Right. And so you even, you know, so like when people, if you want to back, if you want to take a step back and look at, get the wide view, the, the court, even when people have said, oh my goodness, now it's six to three, well, think, well, it's not six to three, right? It's, it's, you, you should hope and that everybody looks through the prism of what does the constitution say? Right. And then, and then, then rightfully so, because you're asking people to, to um, you're asking nine people to largely render an opinion on things that were turn into case made law at a much lower court to to say to render an opinion that considers case case made law but looks at the constitution as the prem- with the premise that it should be looked at absolutely okay? and we're not that's where and people don't want to get into the nuance right. They want to know, okay, is this person going to vote with the left all the time or is this person going to vote with the right all the time? And any time that somebody deviates with it, what do they do? They go back to one of the 45 that put them on the court and excoriates them for not doing their job to make sure that their point of view was considered every day of the week. right? And if you look at like a, a justice like Scalia, he would say that you know liberals and conservatives at one point hated him. Because once he found something that he could pin his hat on in the Constitution, that's what he went to town with. And that's how he voted. I don't, like I said, I, I, there's decisions that he's rendered an opinion on where I'm like, what are you thinking? But again, when he comes out and says, here's the piece of the Constitution, I'm like, ah, okay, I'd rather that than I watch CNN this morning and somebody told me to vote this way. Yeah, exactly. You know? So, so you know, switching you know, quite quickly, you know, quickly you know, for, uh, so we can get out of here in a way. <laughs> top, top, top presidents. To me, there's only two. It's George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. Outside of that, everyone else is kind of in the, you know, to me, they might be on the upper echelon of the middle, but you know, George Washington, you know, found, you know, father, father of the country, first president, you know, intentionally chose not to run again, saying that I do not want we to. do not need another king. Right. I, I was just that's what I was gonna say about Washington. Le- Lincoln. <clears throat> obviously um, stepped in and intervened and shepherded through uh, an extremely, who do you think the best modern president is? Modern? Like when, when, what do you say modern as in from like what years? Like what do you consider modern? Like from the sixties on? No, let's say from, from 1900. 1900. Right. Cause really what you're, what I'm asking is, you're going to include um, you're going to include both Roosevelts, right? Then, 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 if you go Truman, both, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Truman, Nixon, Eisenhower, yeah. and then all of the all of the tele, Truman, Eisenhower, and then all of the truly television presidents. Yeah, uh, you know, um, I, I mean, I I'm going to have to go with with Reagan in that upper echelon. Um, he his policies pretty much led us through the Cold War um, <laughs> to be able to get through that. Um, you know, he had to turn around w- and basically undo everything that FDR had done. Well, um, actually, he, he, he and he was and he was saddled with the debt, debt and inflation burden that um, that Carter allowed to happen. Right, right. Um, you know, his, uh, you know, FD. I mean, this is why I just get on like people thinking FDR is so great. I think he was, you know, to me, you know, only reason why he's not the worst is because Woodrow Wilson was so flamboyant about being a racist. Um, right. yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, yeah. That's he did everything but had the hood on. Right, right. You know, mm-hmm. and so FDR was was a little bit, you know, more nonchalant about it. But there was things that he, you know, that the this aspect of the New Deal, I think, you know, hurt this country for decades. Um, and and Reagan basically, you know, went out, negotiated because you know it's not like they had a Republican-controlled Congress. Well, you know? I was, yeah, I was going to say that. 
you know, and he had to negotiate. He had to get them to believe in him. Uh, and he did. And he's one of the, you know, the few presidents um, in terms of, you know, of, of Republican to, to win that amount of states. I, I think there was only I because I, I even think he won California. Um, I mean, he was the governor of California for a right. while. But, I mean, as I, I look at it, I look at it like this. <clears throat> Again, the power of the presidency is in the bully pulpit. I don't think in the modern era anybody used the bully pulpit of the presidency any with any more effectiveness on a global stage than Reagan. Yeah. Right. Uh, the exam I like, and more importantly, he also understood to be a an effective domestic president. You have to work with Congress, right? And Tip O'Neill, who was the Speaker of the House at the time, also understood that in order to keep, at the time, in order to keep the Democratic majority of the House that had existed since 1954, he was going to have to work with the president. And both O'Neill and Reagan were comfortable giving each other the credit for the success of the nation. And... When, for example, Star Wars, the Star Wars package of of fluff is the one of the best bluffs ever. Yeah, right? yeah. they took some pictures of a you know of a missile almost hitting something and turned that into Star Wars, and they <clears throat> said that we were they and and I think it's a great it's a great piece of theater in saying that we're going to build this dome, this shield over um, around um, around America and our allies that will protect us from all these missiles. And then they put a price tag of trillions of dollars on it. It got the, it got Americans, a certain segment of Americans duly agitated that we were going to waste all this money on something that may or may not work while people were starving in the streets. And there were, so people, the, the American public to a certain extent was upset about it. And he kept talking about it. And if you read Gorbachev and Yeltsin and so, some of the, you know, writings about, when, when the wall fell down, when this Soviet Union kind of disintegrated, a lot of it was predicated on the fact, hey, if they're going to build this, we've either got to commit those resources to do that or feed our people. Right. And he knew that and he knew that he could get in front of the world stage and and put pressure on it. Well, in the background, insinuating and it's it's great tactics. Right. If, for example, if a new if an aircraft carrier is in the South China Sea, that's an act of war, right? In a certain place. But if the president says a carrier battle group is on its way to the South China Sea, that's diplomacy. Oh yeah, yeah. Right? He understood that nuance better than any president. Oh, and absolutely. Heels, well, and on the heels of a president that got on television with a with a rolled neck sweater and told us to turn our heat down. And we're going to have to suck it up because the Arabs hate us and they're, they've cut off the gas supply. Yeah. Right. That's when you what at the time. Right. Because we didn't kind of transition to this modern era of, of hatred. Right. At the time, he was benefited of the fact that Americans did not feel good about being Americans. And he turned that around while turning the economy around. Because if you look in 83, he had to agree to raise taxes in order to basically right the ship, yep, right. And to his credit, I think the next president that learned that lesson was Clinton. Yeah, absolutely, right. we can talk about Clinton's personal behavior on another thing, and that's you're either you either doesn't bother you or it does. And I'm not here to advocate for either one, but he he looked at the lessons of Reagan, and he also understood that he was going to have to work with Newt Gingrich in that in the House because he you know he just happened to be there when. The Ameri when the American people said, hey, we want the Republicans to be in charge after 40 years in the House. And he understood that he wasn't going to get elected unless he worked with with um, with uh, Newt Gingrich. Right. Years ago, I this is probably early, you know, after early 2000s, mid 2000s, I was at an event in D.C. where Newt Gingrich was speaking and somebody stood up and talked about how how President Clinton turned around the economy. Right. And he started chuckling and he's like, he goes, you know, that's fair. He goes, because every president has to has to take the burden of every failure and they should get by large measure the the uh, the benefit of all the success. So he, he outlined what he felt, where he felt the president should be. 
And then he said, but what you don't understand, because apparently we're not teaching how government works anymore, is he had to negotiate with the House to do this. Mm -hmm. And he goes, and that's what the lesson that we should take away was that we we used politics in a way that was best for the nation on the day. Right. And people can disagree with how you think, but in that time, it turned the economy around and got everything moving to the point where what Clinton was widely considered a great president economically, you know, we weren't in, we weren't uh, engaged in full scale, you know, conflict with anybody. We were, we were realizing, I think in some cases, short-sightedly the peace dividend, but he was doing the things to, um, that he felt, right? Like I said, you, you can disagree with him, but he was doing the things he felt to put America on the right course at that time. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. You know, um, going back to Reagan for- yeah. Going back to Reagan for a moment, this is this is how um, the country voted uh, for Reagan. He lost on, on, on with Carter. He lost five states. Yep. He lost Hawaii, Georgia, Maryland, West Virginia and Minnesota in 1980. Yep. It was a landslide. I don't think another Republican president based on their current politics will ever win California again. Um, no. And in 1984, it was even more yep. crushing. He only lost Minnesota. Minnesota, right. Uh, and when people talk about, you know, Clinton could have gotten elected again, I, I, Clinton would not have gotten elected if Reagan was still running, right? <clears throat> if we didn't have this aspect, you could only do two terms, you know, Bush, you know, the you know, Bush senior wouldn't have been there and neither would have Clinton because Reagan would have destroyed, you know, Clinton on stage and, you know, you would never have had to worry about, uh, you know, uh, what's his name, um, Perot ever being able to run. I mean, you know, the, the thing that Clinton had, which was which was really good, he understood uh, the camera. He was very charismatic, understood how to give that that speech. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, I don't think that Clinton was a bad president. I think I put him in that you know, tier three category, in my opinion, where it's in that upper, you know, upper side of, yeah. of, you know, better than average, right? He did some really, really, really good things. Um, you know, I think what, what certainly hurts him is his personal choices, um, you know, in terms of, in my mind, I mean, because I think the president should be beyond reproach, which is why I, I, I'm not a big fan of president Trump. I mean, I think, you know, President Trump is going to wind up going down when we look back in history as an average president. His policies um, were were actually pretty good. It's the fact that he we couldn't get his rhetoric, right. um, you know, out of don't the, hit send. Right, you know, if he had not done those things, I think people would have had a much better opinion of him mm -hmm. um, because you his policies what? were pretty good. But you know what, every other president was able to do that he that he wasn't able to do is all of that same rhetoric that he puts out there got out there about every other president, every other candidate, every other legislator. They just had their henchmen do it. Yeah. Right. Because that's what henchmen do. Right. That you, you have to, that's again, that's the bully pulpit of the pro presidency. You have to be seen to be above it. Yep. Right. And um, I, the one thing I think the left should be celebrating President Trump for every day of the week. And I mean the ardent side, like the really hardcore leftists. He didn't engage us in any military action in four years. Yep. In fact, he was doing everything he could to pull that back as quickly as possible. Right. Now, in doing so, do you understand some of the nuances of what you know what you've put out there for the past four years? But we have been actively engaged in conflict since since forever. Right now, it ramped itself up after 9/11, but we were going from one minor conflict to another. Well, I would say, and 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 I don't know the the entire background of this, but I think he did one thing militarily very foolish, which was authorizing the strike against uh, Soleimani. Um, that could have caused us to go to war with Iran right then and there, um, <clears throat> and I don't know. All of the, the 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 intel that he may have had in order to do it, maybe there was a really good reason, but uh, I don't I don't think the Middle East needs another war with uh, uh you know Iraq's gonna but with another country that starts with an I you know so you know I think uh, you know going to war with Iran knowing they have 
nuclear capabilities, I think uh, could be very detrimental uh, to the Middle East and and all of Europe for that matter. Because if they were to launch something, I mean, I don't, it would never make it to the continental United States, um, but it could certainly make it to Europe. Strike Europe, yeah. yeah. You know, I don't think the defenses are are good enough for that close range. I mean, we've got you know thousands upon thousands of miles to take care of a of something there, but. I think that was the only thing that I would say I I, I didn't quite understand the uh, the strike of that. Right. I I I think like for me for my dollar like looking at it in, in trying to ignore some of the negative aspects of President Trump's bl- you know blusteriness if, if, for lack of a better word would be <clears throat> North Korea. North yeah. Korea oh, he North- he absolutely neutralized North Korea and he but did no, it the but how did he right do way. it? He did it in a way that nobody since no secretary of state or any foreign policy apparatus since 1953. So when Eisenhower was president could find an effective way to deal with the North Koreans. Right. So your choices are go in and pound them back into the stone age, which they already are. Admiral Olson years ago, who was a four star in charge of special operations commands was asked in front of a Senate panel, what countries do you fear? And he's like, the countries that we all need to fear are the ones that when you look at a satellite image of the globe at night, don't have lights on, Yep. right? North Korea being the prime target of that, right? Again, I got to feed my people or we can have power, you choose, right? And in economically isolating the North Koreans in the way that they've done, it did nothing. It basically emboldened them for the better part of 70 years, right? President Trump said this, the North Korean leader, as soon as Trump took office, started rattling his saber because that's what they do. And it's like there's a pattern of, you know, of North Korean dictators over the past. It is like it's, we're going to rattle our sabers. We're going to launch this. We're going to do that. He's like, great. If you do, we're going to stop you because we got more we got more weapons than you do. And people on the far left and every and a lot of Americans are like, that's crazy. He's going to get us involved. They're, we're going to have a shooting war with people that want to shoot ICBMs. Right. Or medium. Break. More importantly, <clears throat> We're not doing in at the time, I would say that people are like, we're not doing the, the best we can do to help defend politically or milita- politically and, and certainly the South Koreans. Right. Which is one of the most vibrant economies in Asia. And what he did was really like Old Testament eye for an eye. Right. That bully a bully comes out and pokes his thing, poke him right back. But then he did the most presidential thing that he did his whole entire four years. He went to North Korea, stood at the DMZ. When they raised the gate, he walked to that side of the DMZ, walked in that guy's front door, shook his hand, stared him in the eye. Yeah. All of the- all of What the, other president would do that? All of the minor secretaries of state, whether it's Kerry, all the, everybody's up on their chiming, whoa, what, what an idiot, blah, blah, blah. But you know what we haven't heard from? We haven't heard a terse word from North Korea, not because we're economically crushing them or anything else, but because he's like, OK, that guy showed up and I he means what he says. Right. And we're not I don't want to I don't want to agitate that. Right. You in life, you poke the bear because, you know, the bear is not going to poke you back. Right. Once you understand that, like, hey, here's the empathy piece. I understand you've been under crushing debt, crushing economic sanctions for 70 years. If you want, and we want to help, but you have to start behaving differently. People call it the carrot and the stick. It's effort, it's empathy and accountability, right? I get where you're at. I don't like where you're at either. I hate the fact that as Americans, we have to isolate a country like Korea, like North Korea. I hate it, right? As a president, that's what I would say. I hate the fact that we have to do this, but you, much like a petulant child, go to your room. You can't behave the way you're behaving and act and be considered a, a functional member of the world community. So come on in for the big win because it's not going to work out for you unless you do because you might be able to punch us in the face, but we'll wipe you off the planet, right? And not in a threatening, but it's like it's understanding of how to make somebody want to be compliant because you're trying to help them, but you're going to hold them accountable for their actions. Economic sanctions don't hold people accountable for their actions. No, it they, makes them more desperate. Well, and it emboldens despots because they can turn around and say to their people, oh, if it wasn't for the for the UN and America, we could be prospering. 
It's the same reason why the Nazi party came to power because of the amount of things that we did to remove their identity and put Germany right. in such a bad spot. Yeah. You know, and, and when I look at what President Trump did, I don't I don't believe that I could I could find back in our modern history another president with the cojones to go do what he did in North Korea. Because what, all it would take, you know, okay, yeah, sure, we might go to war with North Korea and it wouldn't last very long, but the president would still have been shot dead. Right. You know, he, he knowing that he could lose his life, but it was more important to get North Korea back focused on being a part of the, the world again. Um, that was more important to to him than losing his life. Given, and, given him a path. It's about giving people pathways. Right. <clears throat> again, it's once you truncate hope. When you know the reason in, in the U.S. In particular, I'll use the U.S. because everybody that we have in major American cities, this massive gun violence problem is because people have no hope, right? Yeah. They've been they've been destitute for so long and trapped in a system for so long that they don't feel they can rise above, that they don't care anymore. And if you have no hope, then shooting somebody doesn't seem like a big deal. Because right? what's the worst thing that's going to happen? I'm going to go to prison Well, I'm kind of there already, right? And I mean, metaphorically, right? And that... <clears throat> Once you once somebody steps forward and says, I want to help, but it's not just going to be here's a bucket of money. Try to go figure it out. Act act poorly on the way. Right. And I would say that certainly in the last you know, I think one of the, the bigger problems with America going to places to say we're going to help and you have to behave yourself is subsequent to World War Two. And, you know, over time, we uncover these things. Have we acted the way that we're advocating other people to act? You know, and I think that's the way uh, as as what all leaders should be doing. And right. actually, I think it's a must do <clears throat> is if you're preaching it, live it. Right. And but, you know, the president of the United States, you can preach whatever you want, but it's the bully pulpit. And, w and then what Reagan, when part of Reagan's magic is he could lift people that didn't want to be lifted to, to his point of view by how he articulated his vision of America. Yeah. Right. And I do I think that he would work today? Probably not. Right. Because people still wanted the, the people that were my age in 1980 were starting to feel like the America they grew up in in the 40s and 50s wasn't the America they were living in. And he hearkened them back to a time of American exceptionalism that they remember from being in grade school. Yep. That they hadn't felt probably since the mid 60s. Very true. Right? What do the people of my generation want their president to say? What do they want from their president? Do, do you want to say, hey, <clears throat> I'm 55. I've never saved for my kids college. And now I want the federal government to expunge the debts of my children. Right. That's because that's really what we're asking for in loan forgiveness. Right. Yeah. You know, so, but this is, a, this is the thing about you know, it. And, and, do, I want, do I want to be, do I want to live in a place that has higher aspirations of how we should function globally? Right. You know, but, but there's a mixed message as to what the, what the federal government has been, been giving when it comes to student loans. Right. And, and, and I go as much as I would definitely benefit from my student loans being wiped out, I would absolutely benefit from that. It would allow me to, you know, start, you know, other businesses and really, you know, do this because that's what I, that's what I want to do. Um, but the mixed message is we will bail out banks and car manufacturers and airlines, but we won't bail out the American people. And that's the I mixed agree. message. I agree. Right. But <clears throat> and for the record, know, I'm against bailing out all of them. Right. I don't think we should have bailed out the airlines, the banks, the car manufacturers. And I don't think we should bail out people that did student loans. I think, hey, sorry, you made some bad business decisions there. You know, GM. Um, you suck. Go sell. Does the world need a Cadillac? Right. No. I mean, that's really what you're saying. Does the world need a Cadillac? You know, and you know, if you look at you know the you know people's worst instincts about assigning assigning blame or assigning uh, culpability or assigning a reason for an action, they're going to say hey, they were trying to save the unions. I don't necessarily agree with that, but it's you know. Look at the U.S. Postal Service, right? You talk about a declining business, right? Every year, 
more, less and less people have relevant mail delivered to a mailbox. Okay. Well, I mean, it's yeah. not it, it's not just them. Amtrak, like we're literally saving oh, yeah. two different industries that if you can't run a better business than uh, then you know, guess what? You you shouldn't. And and the post post service was not supposed to be a quasi government agency like it is now, right. and it's failing. Let well, it die. <laughs> part of the it's failing is because Congress has said, "Hey, you've got to you've got to stockpile seventy. I think it's seventy five years worth of retirement benefits. Basically, retirement benefits for people that don't even work there yet." Yeah, it's crazy. And so you're saying, "Hey, take four billion dollars of your revenue roughly every year and pump it into a retirement fund, right?" Well, they they lose four and a half billion dollars a year. Yeah, right? and they're not allowed to get rid of people. Like their workforce is set. You've got a workforce that's designed to deliver much more much more mail than than is actually being delivered and when you saw like when they started the mail-in voting they're like oh president trump's ripping up mailboxes no the postal service has a plan based on statistics to get rid of get rid of things that aren't needed mailboxes being number one All right people just yeah. don't walk down i mean like i that's the like this part of that's the piece of government that makes me go apoplectic is like we're not looking to be efficient at any step in the way, right? Here's the thing: Is it? Do I want all the postal workers to be unemployed? Absolutely not. But just like, do I want all the auto workers to be unemployed? Absolutely not. But at what point do we say it's not our job to save every business? It's our job to innovate and grow, and not. I mean, steel industry is great is the prime example. I remember like because my mother's from the Pittsburgh area. And so we used to go there all the time. And it was everybody worked at the steel industry or something re related to it. And one of my friends, like people lived across the aisle, like the, the father, he's, he was like railing against putting robots in in 1968. Like and he's like because they were asking to give up five percent of the jobs to put robots in. Well, you didn't give up five percent of the union employment. You gave it all up. Right. It just took a little bit longer to kill the industry. Right. And so then the steel industry went where to Korea, because it's a capital. It's a once in a lifetime capital investment to to build a steel factory. Where is it all going now? Well, I mean, there's some, you know, I don't know where it's all it's going. All going to, it's all going to India, all, you know, that whole area. Why? Because once once the you know, once that equipment becomes anachronistic and now because of technology that cycle of Moore's law is making it anachronistic much more quickly that it's going to move from place to place to place because it is a, it's a unbelievable capital expense yeah. and manpower is not how we solve problems generally anymore. Technology is how we're solving problems. And that is going to be the conundrum for the 21st century. How do we take people that largely will not fit into the workforce of the 21st century and get them there? That's a great question. And does and does student loans solve that? Do student loans solve that problem? To tie it all back into, you know, may, maybe it does. I mean, so I know I know what I would do if all of a sudden I had that much freed up because I'd be able to, right. you know, I'd be able to launch my my plan for not just the distillery but the other businesses I have in mind much more quickly because I'd be able to fund it for global and, domination. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I'd, I'd be able to fund it and I'd be able to put, you know, you know, not not in the beginning, hundreds of people, but maybe within the next, uh, you know, 10 years, I'd be able to employ hundreds of people in right. the beginning, you know, probably a, a dozen. But, you know, that's it's got to start somewhere. Well, I, I think it's the same thing. I mean, how many employees did how many employees did uh, Google have when they started? How many employees did Amazon have when they started? You know what I mean? When you start when you start looking at <clears throat> at those grand grand businesses. Okay. But I think that's like when you start, there's an overarching thing. It's like, what are we going to need as, as a nation for employment in the, to run deep into the 21st century? Yeah. And, and, and finishing that, this is where, you know, a lot of the people on, on the left will say, well, because when we give tax breaks to the, the wealthier people, they don't, we don't really see it trickle down. Well, good people, will do good things when they have the stuff available to them. Bad people do not. And I can't, I don't want to make mm -hmm. legislation based on the people who are going to do bad things because they're going to do it no matter what. They will find right. a way to, to, to still do it. And so there are a lot of people 
I mean, I would be considered, you know, much wealthier than what I am if I didn't have, you know, $300,000 in student loans. Well, I mean, I do quite well. I can afford that debt payment. Um, But how much more could I do if I didn't have that? I'd be able to do a lot more. Um, and, And I would. And there's plenty of people. People can say a lot of bad things about Bill Gates. You know, he does donate a lot of his money. He does, through a lot of his foundations, do a lot of good work. There's a lot of them that are like that. Um, and, but I, I don't think that if you taxed Bill Gates more, uh, he might not do as much. Um, I think we, we've, we've, we've forgotten the amount of good nature in Americans. And How, we, right. But here's the thing. What legislation do you think would be passed that your run of the mill billionaire, let alone one of the top five billionaires on earth, couldn't work himself around, right? This is, that's the fundamental oh. thing, right? Yeah, what you're, they, they what, absolutely will. What tax policy does is you get to a point like Malibu. Malibu, California, there's poor people and there's rich people. There's no middle class, right? Because you push the middle class down to the lower middle class and they can't afford to live there anymore because you tax them into submission, right? When we talk about taxes, we're not, it's the that top 0.1%. You can ta- you can say you've got an effective rate of 70%, right? But you know, it's that old thing about how it feels like, hey, you guys driving around in a in a five hundred thousand dollar car. I mean, make fifty thousand dollars a year. Why? Because I've got everything correctly hedged and that's a business asset. It's not my personal property, right? And that, you know, it's like the old joke with kids now, like, hey, I'm glad I learned trigonometry because when trigonometry season comes up and I gotta pay my trigonometry, I know how to do it, right? A financial literacy, whether you and you know if you're on the if you're on the tinfoil hat side, you say not creating a financially literate society is benefit to the government because now you can keep people where you want them, right? But <clears throat> when when it, at one point like a, over a third of NFL rookies didn't understand they had to pay taxes, like they when they got their first check, they're like, "Where's all my money?" Right? Because they would take you know a million dollars divided by sixteen, and when it wasn't all there, they're like, "What's going on?" Right? But when you start, when when you start saying we are going to, we're, that taxation is the method we're going to fix, the uh, fix the money problem or fix the employment problem or fix any problem, it doesn't it doesn't add up, right? It's, it's never going to add up. When you hear most of the people, and it, it's, what, here's what I hear, I'm not telling everybody here this, but when I hear most of the people that get up and rail against billionaires and rail against all these people, it's nothing more than envy. Oh, absolutely. Right? Yeah. Um, here's here's what I do know. And this is a and Bruce Smith, former NFL player, said this to me one night. He, he goes and he speaks at the rookie symposiums and everything like that, right? Um, and he starts talking about money. He, that's all he wants to talk about is the money piece. He's an unbelievably wealthy person because of how he invested the money he made in the 19, 20 years he was in the NFL. Um, but he says, look, he goes, here's what I know about money. He goes, and this is why most lottery winners go broke. He goes, money, it's like, and I'll say the same thing about courage, right, is <clears throat> and integrity. Money doesn't make, it doesn't make you a better person. It makes you more of who you already are. Yep. And if you're a good person, you're going to use that money <clears throat> for good causes in a way that you probably imagined but never thought you'd be able to. And if you're not, you're going to continue to be the bad person you are just at a much more wealthy standard. Right. And that you, there's no getting around that. Right? Absolutely true. Absolutely and, true. Right. And so what I find where I, what I have a hard time with, right. And it might be a limited, a limiting factor on my part is when I hear people, when I hear people say, when I, when you call somebody on the carpet for an action, that they did, like either they did or they did not do, right? You have the option in every situation to do something or do not do something. And like no decision is a decision. No action is an action, right? And standing up for people that are getting bullied. If you don't do that and you have the opportunity, you made a statement Mm -hmm. that you, that you, you know, that silence is consent, right? And nowhere else is that more prevalent than for money, right? People ignore other people's abhorrent behavior for money. 
And the and I you and I have both seen folks that are wealthy and ha- are in a position to hold people to a, to their way of view b- b- by hanging a paycheck over their head. People fold like a house of cards for that. Right. It, would I advocate being a person of integrity every day with that? Probably not. Right. Because there's a there's a sometimes a steep price to pay for that in the short term. But when you start saying, hey, you know, and I think it's some of the problems when you look at athletes. Right. That all of a sudden you get generationally changing money like DeAndre Hopkins he's a re- was a receiver for for uh, Houston. Now he's a receiver for the Cardinals. His mother in a domestic dispute, got blinded with this acid thing. thing. And it's like, they were already, they were already destitute, multiple kids and everything like that. And she was the sole breadwinner. And so when he went to Clemson, he, he stayed through the, when he came out, he's like, I got to feed my family. Right. And he's largely, he's a good person. And so that money has made him a much better steward of, of, a, of a life for his family. Right. And other, and others around him. Right? And if you look at, you know, like I, 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 the example I use lately, just because I think sometimes people look at him as a cartoon character is Guy Fieri. Right. He, he had no he had no likely reason to say, hey, all these restaurant employees are unemployed. What can I do? Right. How can I again, how can I use the bully pulpit of my fame for good? And one guy raced through 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 his initiative, right? There's multiple people that are helping out, but because he said, I want to change and I'm going to help do this. There's $21 million in the hands of different restaurant employees to pay their bills. that wasn't there before, right? How do we do that? How do you do that on a national scale? And also say, Hey, we've got to change how we think about what employment looks like in the 21st century without bankrupting the country. Yeah. I think if you're, if anybody says I want to be president, that's what you got to grapple with every minute of every day and every television camera on your face every minute of every day as well. Absolutely. And I think it would, it would be uh, great to explore more maybe next week, but I would say uh, I don't think it should be a national plan. I think it needs to be get back to the state's rights and empower the states to start making the decisions and stop relying on the federal government for everything. There should be a small federal government and a larger state um, aspect. I agree. Um, and and then each state can start figuring those things out. You know, we should stop looking at like, you know, I, you know, these states are going to have to make some really tough decisions in my opinion. Like they should be the ones to figure out what programs probably shouldn't be as funded as much. So that way we can get the, you know, citizens of those states, you know, back working and being productive and with, with whatever that is, you know, uh, the, the aspect of, of raising the, the minimum wage, I think is wrong. I think, that there's a, a better way of doing it. You know, working at McDonald's should not be a living wage. I'm sorry. It's just, I, I just don't, actually, I'm not sorry. Uh, it's meant as a starter. It's an, un, it's unskilled labor. And, you know, I don't think those things should be rewarded with $30,000 a year. Well, but think about this. You look, and I, I, I said this and some, one of my Marine friends got incensed until I fully acquainted it. McDonald's runs their, runs their human capital like the Marine Corps, mm-hmm. right? Every four years, the Marine Corps wants to largely trade out all of the E1s to E3s, right? Because in order to have maritime infantry, you need a lot of junior people. And so in that four-year period, any given four-year period, the NCOs rise, a small number, because there's only 175,000 Marines roughly, a small number of those, that whole of E1s to E3s rise out of there and they become the NCOs and then some become officers, stuff like that, right? So you have this, a session where the Marine Corps plans to effectively retrain an entirety of its an entire segment of its workforce every four years. And but what they do extremely well, and they have the benefit because you have GI Bill and everything else, is they, they don't talk about you being an ex-Marine, they talk about you being a former Marine. Right. And so you now have you're assimilated into that family for the rest of your life, and you become what? In some cases, a pretty decent marketing tool for the reason to join the Marine Corps. Yeah, absolutely. I think what they do is amazing. And they went off and had great kick-ass uniforms. I mean, you know, you are like, it's a marketer's dream to market for the Marine Corps. Oh, yeah. yeah. But look at McDonald's. They have a largely, when, certainly when I was in high school, that was largely a high school kid workforce. 
And it, by sometimes somebody turns 18, one of those young folks wants to become a manager. And then they start saying, hey, there's a living wage here and thing. In and out burger. They're widely known for the fact that their managers make 100 grand a year. Right. But they're that that paycheck that they get also is tied to success of the store that they manage. Absolutely. You're, right. you're absolutely right about that because so, you know, those don't know, I actually was a, a manager at a Wendy's. Um, they, cause it paid well, right. You know, I was, yeah. uh, you know, 19, 20 years old and it paid, you know, $22,000 a year. Yeah. Um, so I might find I'll, I'll go be a manager. The general manager of a store, uh, of a, of a decent Wendy's, um, will make a hundred grand a year. Right. Easily. But that's what I'm saying is like, but that's the, the intent is for somebody to find that business, right? That industry, whether it's the Marine Corps, find, hey, I want to make this my life's work, or hey, I like the food service business, right? And think about it, how do people become chefs? They want to serve other people, right? When you, people look at chefs and even like even servers, like some people, like they, they're on that bartenders, they're on that, that train of, hey, I like doing this. I mean, remember John from the Walrus, right? He yeah. he had a master's degree in economics from GW, and he was like, "I make more money doing this, and I don't have to contend with stupid people every day of the week that I can't forget about the minute I walk out." Right, right. And he liked that pace of lifestyle and everything like that. And then he didn't like it so much when he became the manager because now there was an accountability piece there, right? But I look at it when you look at um, entry level jobs. To me, it, it falls back on we're do you. Are, are, do you think we should have a national strategy on education or do you think we should still leave it up to the states? Uh, um, states. Okay. So in saying that, how do you get to a minimum standard? I, I don't, I'm not a big believer that I, I, curriculum to me is the hard part, right? But I do think that we, you know, if you're not going to, we got to, if we're not going to say we're going to turn out a generation of savants in the public education system, which I don't think we've given up on that a while ago, um, that because the public education is really good at two things. They're great at special needs kids and they're great at the gifted kids. If you're in that 80 percent in the middle, it's on you and good luck. Right. How do we create it when people get out of high school? If we're going to say that your ability to go find knowledge is the easiest it's ever been with use of the internet and everything else. How do we, how do we train kids to be able to do that and train them to be financially literate and good citizens? So, you know, first, you know, I, I think this, this it comes back down to accountability, which we, we no longer hold parents. It's not a lot in many cases oh. ourselves, our elected officials and like that accountable, right? Same. <clears throat> yeah. Same. <laughs> so, you know, it's not the government's job to bail everyone out. I just, I, I just don't I agree with that. All right. So if I'm going to, if I, you know, got to be the, 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 the grand poobah of, uh, of the state of, of Indiana or wherever, I'm going to start with, you know, you, you, you've got to figure out where it is that we need to be, right? This comes back to me you know, from, for me, you know, one of the first things, one. right. Well, not even just business. Like, so um, for me, this was just architectural design. Um, so the Zachman no, framework, if you're an in industry, if you're in anything, like if I don't know where I'm at, how can I know where I start, where I need to start? Right. So I need to know, I need to have the vision of where I need to be and I need to know where I'm at and then develop that transition plan. Right. right. Those, those are the three pieces. And so part of that is, you know, not everyone needs to go to college. College is not the ultimate place for truth and knowledge to be attained. It's no. a, a way. Um, we have forgotten that, and, and we have over uh, emphasized the importance of college, which I believe is what's taken away from people wanting to do a trade. My stepfather um, was a master welder, and he learned this trade in the Navy. And I don't know what distinction they got, but they would they would put his welding under like an, an X-ray to look right. for fractures in it, and they, you know, basically he, they didn't have, he didn't have any. Right. And he learned this skill in the Navy. He was a welder in the Navy, which is why he wound up getting a ALS. It was, you know, Johns Hopkins come out and said 90% of the welders in the military, if they were in the Vietnam era, you're going to have ALS. Right. Um, they don't know what the connection is, but they know something there happened. Yeah. But anyway. One's in the kitchen with the candles stick. We just don't know how he got there. Right. And he you doesn't know, either anymore because he's got ALS, right? Right. You know, he, he passed away, you know, a year ago. Um, and uh, he could basically 
build anything. Like he could, you know, this, you know, right. he, he worked for the pharmaceutical companies um, after, you know, afterwards. And he basically was going around, you know, ma- fixing their equipment, go all around the world, fix their equipment. Cause he could weld, he could do whatever we, you know, we've lost that aspect. Like a welder today, like if you're in Virginia beach, you're probably making 200 grand. Yeah. Oh, no doubt. They're absolutely. And that's, a, I mean, you know, it's the funny thing is, is Jared, my son's getting ready to graduate college here in May. And I was, what do you want to do? He goes, I want to be a welder. His idea at first was he wants to build big pieces of art and things like that. Right. Um, and I'm like, that's awesome. Yeah. Newport new shipbuilding right now. They're, they're hurting so bad for tradesmen that they're effectively pay students 22 bucks an hour to show up and learn. That's 40 some grand a year. Yeah. Right. right? Yeah. Just to learn. And you're under no obligation to stay there after you graduate. Absolutely. And so I, it's that. And I was talking to a bunch of folks that weld. They're like, hey, we can teach you how to weld, but that certificate is what gets you into that. I think there's a, I was talking to a friend of mine who lives in Birmingham, and he was saying that um, his best friend's little brother did that, went to one of the shipyards in the US somewhere, probably down in, probably down in Pasigula, Mississippi, because that's the next, another big one where people will go get it, where we build ships. And um, he's, he has a welding truck. And he drives around Birmingham welding all the time. He made 300 grand last year, right? Why? Is the job's worth 300 grand? You know why? Because there's a big gap. There's 55, 70 year olds that are still welding. And then there's nobody down to about 30 right now. Because yeah. about three or four years ago, people were like, hey, I can make a buttload of money welding. Yeah, because we, we have said that blue collar work is we're, beneath us. Well, we're, we're too good to work with our hands as a nation. Yep. Right. You know, and, and the funny thing is, I mean, this is, you know, to me, it's, it's kind of ironic here. I have, I've spent all my, my, my career in technology and now I'm going to go back and do something that is with my hands, which is essentially, you know, with the distillery. And of course right. it'll be some other things. You're, you're going to be an artisan. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, 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 and my thing is, so I'm learning how to weld right now. Right. And the reason is, is because when I, in, in 10 years, maybe less, uh, but definitely in 10 years, I envision that I'm going to need a still that is much larger than what I have today. And I want to be able to say, I built that I still. That, right. So and the only way for me to do that is to learn how to weld, to bend, bend these metals to my will right. to produce a unique spirit. But that's all. Awesome. Well, that's like, you know, that's, you know, it's a whole Edison thing, right? I mean, he didn't, he didn't fail a thousand times. He just, found 999 ways that a light bulb didn't work. Right. So getting back to, you know, the states need to take a look at what do they want their outcome to be. Right. And the, the trade schools, even technology, mm-hmm. I think should be a trade school uh, at this particular point. You know, universities have their place. Trade schools um, need to come back because that will allow the wages and of manufacturing to um, come back to the United States because we'll be able to build things again right. at affordable rates. And, you know, and of course, you know, Indiana, you know, all states should be looking to promote the businesses in their state doing business with other businesses in that state to yeah. keep the keep that there. And then then you only deal with interstate commerce when um, it becomes because the state of Indiana actually knows how to produce this better right. than another state. And, you know, I think at that point, that vision will wind up being able to get back to where the states actually do matter. Um, and people pay more attention to our state politicians and and the, the officials that we are entrusting and we can hold them accountable. I think certain states are doing it incredibly well, though, right now. Yeah. Like, you, look at, you look at Texas. I mean, the big joke yeah. when when Secretary Perry was the governor of Texas was that he should have uh, California citizenship for how often he was there getting businesses to move to Texas. Yeah, absolutely. Right. You know, and it's funny. I read an article the other day that the NASDAQ is in, in talks with the state of Texas to move the NASDAQ out of New York City, right? I mean, you start talking about a fundamental shift, like all the, a lot of the tech money is moving out of Northern California, it's moving to Austin, Texas, or it's moving to the Beltway, right? <clears throat> More the Beltway because of the, a lot of the talent, educated talent that already exists there, that those folks get out and they wanna be entrepreneurial, they stop working for government agencies and they wanna be entrepreneurial and things like that. And then, Austin has kind of been this burgeoning tech hub for a while. And now we're going to we're going to say, hey, we're going to make a business environment that's going to encourage you to do that. Right. And I think that when you look at that, um, Kansas, Congressman Yoder from the Kansas third, second or third, I think it is, you know, they've been for years touting what they call the Silicon Valley. 
and it's um, moving moving you know companies like Google and others to uh, office space near K State and University of Kansas, right? I mean, you got hedge funds that are like starting to move to Florida, and I think I I, I don't know what city, but it'll be one of the cities. I was I'm gonna guess either Jacksonville or Orlando. That's just my wild ass guess that they're gonna become a financial hub. Right. Because they can, because the state is made it conducive to do business there. Right. And I think really what you're talking about is what <clears throat> how do you do does a state or more importantly, does a governor or a legislature look at businesses as a source of revenue or as a source of job creation? Right? And if they look at it as a source of revenue, they're never going to get it right. Correct. I agree. And I think that's the bigger problem. And you say, you know, and people are now like, oh, Texas is going to turn blue. Like, well, here's the thing. You do you want do where do you, how do you want a great business climate? Where do you want it? Right. When you have a state, <clears throat> when you have a state like California wanting to advocate that anybody that lives in Arizona or Nevada has to pay, pay a special tax to work in California. Right. Because they're lose those folks are saying, screw it, I'm moving. Right. Why? Because what what have we proved? We can work remote. Yep. Absolutely. I mean, Google, Google should basically I mean, they should be kissing the ground that, that Zoom walks on right now or, you know, the, the, the pandemic walks on. Because think about all the people they're paying an engineer out of college with probably 150, 200 grand. Right. Yeah. Because they, they can't afford to live within an hour of work. And they how how can you tell somebody that's extremely intelligent and they've gone to the point where like, hey, we don't even demand it. Um, college education anymore, right? Because why are they looking? They're looking for skill-based employees, knowledge-based employees, not certificate or degree-based employees, right? And I think that's, and you've talked about this, and that's a fundamental change. And, you know, you, me, and Jason were on on Twitter the other day that cyber education in particular, I mean, with the, you know, 3.3 plus million jobs globally and 600, 700,000 in the U.S. alone, that you don't need four years to get after that, right? You need a good six month or year training pipeline so that the first time you're dealing with malware isn't as a SOC analyst, you know, security analyst, junior guy, isn't on a production network that your company has that you got hired from. And so how are we looking at cyber education? Right? And there's some innovative companies that are, that are wanting to do things, but the, the administrative burden to get, um, if you're if you're a bigger company that kind of has a semi-established education profile, you can flim flam the paperwork and become a diploma mill for for any kind of education. Cyber. Yeah. If you're a legitimate cyber purveyor that owns a cyber range that has a curriculum that has committed people to make that reactive to to the needs of students, and you want to train veterans, you want to train, you want government assistance to help for retraining that's available to all sorts of industries, the paperwork's burdensome and it takes a long time, right? So how do we streamline that, right? Well, guess what? A governor can get that streamlined a lot better than an individual, right? And so and what do, what do people want to do? I would say that if you took away the stigma of trade schools, which there definitely is now, right? And you worked hard to do that, we would have much less of an issue getting people to go because it's people like one of the things, why do you like building the distillery? Because at the end of the day, whether it's putting drywall up on the building or pushing a bottle of whiskey across the counter to sell it, you can see the product of your work. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's right. a big reason. It's um, not zeros and ones. It's not ethereal, right? If you can, you can, as you're building a home, right? You turn around like, boom, it's done. Right. Yeah. That's the value of trades. That's why people love the trades, because at the end of the day, they, they can they can see and feel production and gratification. Absolutely. You know, it's and you, you said it earlier, I, I'm looking to be more of an artisan at right. this point. And and that's because I want to I want to produce something, produce something of, of that, you know, people can enjoy. You know, there's a, they, they say that the, the most, um, you know, selfless thing you can do is to feed someone. Right. All right, that's and that's literally why I like the whole chef thing is, and I love cooking. Uh, uh, right, somebody else. Right, and you know how do we tend to, to you know, to celebrate a a good or or even a, a bad day? I mean, when we were food back in Town Circle, you food. know, it was food and 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 bourbon, right? That's uh, 
that's what we did you know, on what you know on we had uh you know, you know, wings and bourbon night, you know, yeah. at, at, at silent circle, right. That's what we, that's what we did. And so I want to create that. I want to, and I want to, you know, when someone, you know, and they, and they get to understand the, the why, you know, right. uh, about around each one, because I, and I call from the whiskey side, each of them are called a project. This is project, right. blah, blah, blah. Why? Because it's going to always be a work in progress, right? It's, it's not going to be finished. Um, and then there's some other things, but it's, it's so people can enjoy something. And then I have a way of giving back uh, to the, you know, to the community. Cause I plan on being big. <laughs> the emotional component to that is you're talking about the difference between happiness and joy. Yeah. Right. Happiness is a destination. Joy is a journey. Yep. Right. And if you, if, if you're done, if you're happy, meaning you're satisfied when you push that bottle of liquor across that you made that, then you're not going to innovate. You're not going to be better. You're not going to be servicing your customer base, you're not going to be giving of yourself the best way that you possibly can. Right. Yeah. Why, when you, when you figure this thing out and you have the restaurant, I'll be out there as your chef. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. All right, my friend. Uh, thank you so much for. No, it was great. It was a great talk. Great. Really dug it. Yep. Yeah. And so hopefully everyone will, hopefully everyone enjoyed it out there in uh, YouTube land and Facebook and uh face space my book and the yeah Twitter. all the you know we're streaming to five different places here at the moment hey have um, you seen the new progressive commercials where they have the guy that's trying to keep people from being their fathers uh, <laughs> buy a home? and the guy says up when i use the new progressive whatever the tool am i hashtagging and he just is like oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's 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 where we're at i don't don't be your dad yep exactly well everyone enjoy your week happy new year and See you next week. Have a great week, folks.